what is up youtube tonight we are talking about balloons and educating you on all the history of balloon science you know from its humble beginnings with uh the french in 19th of september in 1783 where these brothers over in france decided to uh make a paper balloon and you know burn a fire underneath it to fill it with hot air you know these chinese lanterns were probably known about for a long a longer time before that you know smaller balloons but they wanted to build one that was big enough to actually lift uh, you know people and um and they did that and uh and then ever since then you know they i i don't know when the first hydrogen balloon was but uh the first balloons that they started using hydrogen gas were um a next step in the technology much later on won't forget Guzmao though right because there's also bartolomeo Guzmao was the portuguese Bra was brazilian priest but he's portuguese colonial priest and he built an airship in uh the 1600s and there's a number of other examples of airships that were built um, now this obviously is more of a you know an artistic rendering later, but right, the Vimanas in India also like claim that they were they built airships that used like uh, gases and stuff like this too. So right, and um, then there's the Peruvian airships, um, which there's examples of Peruvian airships. Uh, if I type in ancient, were these for travel or atmospheric research mostly? Do you know? Like to get uh, high up or to get so in, in for instance, like Bolivia, where the mountains and the Andes, where the mountains are really high, uh, an airship's really practical to get from one place to the other where it's really, really close, except that there's an, an ascent and a descent of thousands of feet between the two peaks, right? But the peaks are right next to each other. So, you know, and, and people for a long time tried to doubt that there were airships that the Peruvians had airships, but it's even into their culture to this day to have these flying squirrel suits. Right. Have you seen the Bolivian or Peruvian? I'm just thinking, um, would you want to find out what was up in the atmosphere? You know, the, the original research, it seems like that doesn't exist until the twenties, which is bizarre to think that these people weren't trying to figure out what was up high, how high the atmosphere went, um, you know, I mean, well, what's also interesting is like, so places like in Bolivia, they have Sucre. Sucre is 13,000 foot elevation. So that's like base camp Mount Everest. Uh, and that's just their city. So if you think about it, they're so much higher up into the, into the thinner air than we're used to being at any point. Also, that's a, that's something to consider. Yeah. That's makes it even harder to make uh, hot air balloons uh, according to the physics though. Cause right. you know, you want, you want a denser fluid, the denser the air is um, and the colder the air is the hotter, you know, the faster your hot air balloon will rise. Um, right. So it calls into question what kinds of materials are they using, which is really interesting because then that asks you about the silk road. Right. And there's so many places where the silk road in places that have been called the Silk Road, where there isn't a lot of foot traffic, and we can look and see where there's been foot traffic for thousands of years, but it looks like what it's been is there's actually been silk balloons. There's silk balloons in certain places cool. as well, which are historic. before they had airplanes. The, the only way to get aerial photographs was with balloons. So they would a lot of photographers would take they you know pay good money to get uh, a balloon to go up in a balloon, and so there was aerial surveying and. Um, and also aerial reconnaissance uh, civil military. war balloons can yeah, you imagine being one of those can you imagine being one of those kids like so let's say you're like a 17 16 17 year old kid and they're like you got a special mission for you and you think you're gonna get like a good promotion and they put you in a freaking weather balloon experiment with these i mean they they, they haul out these well it's giant... a tether they're, they're, you're tethered to the ground but if, if that tether lets go you're floating away to who knows where and, and so and high up though and cold up. and you're not probably covering your ears and like it's just freezing and you're supposed and like you're up in the sky looking and what you're what are you doing you're looking they for didn't the have other the ways to, to let let air air out too um if it was if it was a gas you know gas balloon rather than you know hot air balloons would only stay up for so long but a lot of these were gas filled balloons um they would uh they would react you know high like acids with um metal the tanks they would have these zinc, tanks if you put zinc pellets and hydrochloric acid for example um it will make hydrogen gas so that so they the, got that, one tank of one gas and the other tank, and then they put them together to create the chemical reaction right in the balloon yeah we'll see like so gas i think it's like about one thing though 
like it, you're talking about 13,000 feet. And if you look at the ionosphere and the magnetosphere and everything, whenever the mountains go up and you're at a higher elevation, that the magnetosphere actually goes over it. So is the air density really as thin as what it is whenever you're at a lower elevation or is it adjusting? I mean, all yeah, I was when I was in Sucre, I would thing, like right? feel like I was passing out. I would be like laughing. That's a, that's a great, right? a great question, and it, and it leads to the one of the interesting facts that um, the 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 best place to watch to to where the hot air balloons uh, are every year is in a place called Albuquerque, New Mexico, where the um, the winds of Mount Sandia actually uh, create this perfect. Uh, perfect condition where the wind direction goes one way at a certain altitude and, and it goes the other way um at a lower altitude so the winds you know blow, blow like northeast and in one at one altitude and then the winds blow so southwest at, at, at a different altitude so if you want to change direction all you have to do is drop ballast um and and, and raise your altitude um or or or, or uh drop your um you know, gas and, 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 and uh, lower your ballast and then, and then you'll uh, drop your altitude. So you can go back. So that's what they do in the, in the, the hot air balloon festival. Um, so you look up oh, hot air balloon, you know, they exposed us on, remember the show family matters with Steve Urkel and he got caught up in an air balloon and he landed right. the air balloon right on, on the Wilson's front step. And he's like, oh yeah, I just figured out the physics of it. If you raise and lower, you can direct your, uh, where you're going at. Dude, I miss her. To a certain extent, but the air currents aren't like that all over the globe. Albuquerque is like a very special case and it's a, it's a perfect uh, condition. It's just why they have a uh, hot air balloon here in central Jersey um, around September time, usually. And uh, I had some friends who were planning on going flying there. We fly paramotors to fly around them. That's a lot of fun. Been, yeah, been here in Santa Cruz and Carmel, you can get air, um, air balloons pretty regularly as well. So why are we talking about balloons? Well, I mean they're pretty oh. they're pretty practical, and they're, they're, realistically, it's the kind of technology that we should be using. I mean, it looks like other people are using. This well, technology. this is the real reason we're talking oh. about balloons. Let's be honest. It's is the, this is this a good time for my meme? Just really quickly. I'm sorry. I just I just wanted to make sure I got that done. Okay, <laughs> I feel better now. Thank also, you. the uh, if you response to the up. U.S. balloon, Kim Kardashian uh, and the U.S. have released their own spy balloon. There you go. That looks dangerous. Placement. Oh, I think it's I'm pretty sure it's Photoshop. But, uh, Kanye's yeah. so pissed right now watching. This. It is Photoshop, but it has to be. Check out I'm, those antennas. I'm sorry, Kanye. You're always welcome on the show. I know you're you're on Tim Pool, and hopefully. Uh, <laughs> Hopefully we'll be on Tim Pool again soon. They they name dropped us on the show the other night, so I, I got to get back in touch with those guys and get That's back. Fun. Yeah, you do. What did they name drop you for? Can I ask what research was it that they referenced? Ian uh, Ian's a good friend of mine. Man, well, oh, yeah. he knows Andreas, and we, we just uh, the last time I was on there talking about the U.S. Navy patents and and the whole Sal Pays thing and some of the research that's been done into that but yeah it's it's just all it's just a, a bunch of the research because we we've, we've been doing this quite a while and know a lot about the uh, the history of this stuff uh you know going back to you know balloon scientists like luis alvarez you know uh what year is what year is the alvarez from alvarez was born in 1911 and uh he was famous for being one of the balloon scientists on Project Mogul, which were these uh, spy balloon trains that were being built and released in the 1940s. Not, uh, not involved with have problems. you heard of and, August Picard from um, the, like the 1930s? Well, he, he was, was also appointed to Project Blue Book to be a Project Blue Book sci uh, scientist. I think he was a J Jason Defense Advisory Group scientist, member of the Bohemian Club, Oof. and also um, he was uh, the guy that you know, came out with the U.S. Air Force and said that the Roswell crash was a Project Mogul weather balloon train and, um, you know, helped uh, the U.S. Air Force with that, you know, cover story because, you know, the the the, the balloons that they were using on these uh, balloon trains were actually, uh, I think, 
rubber or, or latex balloons. So he's also my... really Chile, he's Chilean. So they went to the see? Chilean source of the uh, the eruption. Uh, so there's an eruption in Atapuerca. And the, him and his brother, I think it was, or was his father, came up with the Alvarez hypothesis, which is the reason a lot of people believe that there was a eruption that led to dinosaurs going extinct. Because the Alvarez hypothesis is that there's a layer of iridium that has somehow coated the world that must have come from some sort of an extraterrestrial location because there's no other source of iridium. Interesting. What's the, what's the tensile strength of this uh, um, this DuPont film? So this is Bopet. It's a DuPont film that was developed in the mid 1950s, and this this is mylar. So mylar uh, couldn't explain the the material that was reported the Roswell crash because it wasn't invented for it until you know a decade or half a decade later. Uh, so the, the memory foil on, that was reported at Roswell, you know. So they say it was, you know, the radar target from the, you know, the weather balloons that they had, uh, the Project Mogul weather balloons. So that's a memory film. Uh, does that have like any similarities to mercury? And well, the look up, look up liquid crystal polymer after when you have a second also, because in, in relation to things like mercury or plastics like mercury, liquid crystal polymer is uh, what they make Vectran out of, which yes. is... um the shoe the lunar gear or something shoe that they make and uh, this is bulletproof but that's not saying much this is i mean silk can be bulletproof this is like particle proof and what you can do is you can make this tube that inflates right so the idea is that if you made a spaceship that you shot up that was like a broom stick and then it inflated into this giant room that was it would be made out of vectran liquid crystal polymer that can expand now, and hmm, andreas uh, like you have more experience in this with me. If you scroll down a little bit, you can see this hexagonal shape. And we all know like the hexagonal shape is like a great structure. They even do airdrops within the military. And this is the energy absorbing shape. Bigelow was big on what he was working on all these kinds of expandable space uh, programs for the, for the, for NASA and stuff before they shut down in, t in 2020. The thing is, this material is so useful for so many things. And it's funny, like the way you do it is you make a shoe. Nike totally did it. Like you, you make vector and shoes and then you can have this material and this material, you could build a house out of it. You know what I mean? Like you can build a spaceship, you can build a, a, a earth ship. It doesn't really, a sea ship doesn't really matter. It's just that you can make this super thin, super expansive material. How do you that spell is it? So liquid crystal polymer Vectran, Vectran, V-E-C-T-R-A-N. Type in that plus liquid crystal polymer, probably. Looks like somebody branded it. Uh, is it yeah. insulating? Uh, it can be. I mean, so the, you can make different various liquid crystal polymers. I mean, let me see if I can type in. Um, it's the second picture. That's one of the look up on Wikipedia. Here, right here. Le Vectran. Uh, is a manufactured fiber spun from from a liquid crystal polymer created by a Salonese corporation and now manufactured by Cura Ray. It is an aromatic polyester produced by the polycondensation of 4 hydroxy hydroxy benzoic acid and 6 hydroxy naphthalene 2 carboxylic acid. Look at that thermal stability on the second paragraph. And this is the hexagonal shape I was talking about. So that means it's very strong and it's creating a lot of thermal like insulation on it. Yeah, I love this stuff. <laughs> I don't really like Nike, but like I like these shoes. You know what I mean? I want this material. It's way cooler than Kevlar. Um, they're comparing it to Kevlar, but don't let that fool you because Kevlar is more like a ceramic plastic, you know, and th th like kind of glassy. And whereas this is, it can it literally it can be woven into like silk like fine material. So you can imagine like the. Um, Lord of the Rings armor or something like it would be made out. It would be made out of Vectran. So this is right. interesting. So let's 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 relate this to the cur the current events of this this spy Chinese spy balloon because the latest uh, talk um, among the experts is saying that this thing could, you know, maneuver and change directions and and do uh you know like so so the Chinese were saying oh this is just uh you know something that blew off course but. Um, now they're saying that, well, this thing was equipped uh, with the ability, you know, some more complex abilities and stuff. And I talked a little bit about this 
on a couple streams in the past and other people brought up this uh th this technology and said oh these things have the ability to shift their altitude so they can catch these high-end streams and that they're able to you know ride these wind currents um like you know i don't see any kind of fans or other stuff on this maneuverability right. but there are technologies that you could apply you don't to need balloons. fans you definitely don't need so this is the thing project loon if you're familiar with google's project loon and a lot of that information was made public so china definitely has it whether it's public or not but you could get this information relies on exactly what you're so saying educate us uh, on project loon so Google wanted to put and did put a bunch of balloons up, loony, like a loony project, crazy project. What if we had these balloons everywhere that were able to communicate with each other? In fact, they could be communicating by measuring. They could be sending signal back and forth, creating an array mesh network. They could do all sorts of things. And as they travel, they can even lift and fall based on what's chemical, what chemicals are in there. We talked a bit about this project that I had worked on, solar balloons back in and um, Ben we worked on this idea of using ammonia NH3 balloons, which would, when the sun rises and sets, produce a chemical reaction ionizing the ammonia gas, which lifts the balloon. And so it goes to a certain level that follows a certain current. But you'd be able to actually control this. That's, that's basically what Google was doing with these balloons. And if you go even weirder, it was the laser internet. Let me see if I can find... Um, How does that control it? Uh, like how so can you control the buoyancy of the balloon just based upon the sun coming out whenever you don't know exactly what's coming? So you can so in the sense that you can actually have tint, uh, chemical tinting of the plastics so it can control when it gets ionization and you can just, just, just decide when you want it to lift and when you want it to fall. Basically, you have control over the altitude of the balloon and then that allows you to follow certain wind currents. And because all the wind currents are measured by this huge mesh network, that it knows exactly where it can be carried. So pretty well, it can be drifted into a current and then taken to where it needs to go. It might take slightly longer than a plane. But again, it's a balloon that's up there for years at a time and just gets where it needs to go without any fuel. And this is why I think like space probes would be similar to a balloon, which is, you know, makes sense where they found all that balloon type, you know, memory foil stuff it could have been a you know part of a, bo a balloon like a, some kind of alien space probe balloon so they're building these laser guided systems that they send yeah. internet by a uh, mesh network from one balloon to another and it actually yes. shoots a laser directly across from one balloon to the other balloon it's like, Star <laughs> it's like starlink you know, but it's like balloon like link balloon and it's way <laughs> Well, that's how to get over the horizon and, and, and set up a OTH, you know, communications grid. That's again, if with laser direct laser link, um, a setup array like that, then it's, it's, uh, it's uninterruptible, but it's still, if you've got to go through atmosphere, but if these balloons are super high altitude balloons, you're getting above that, those stratosphere. Yeah, these can be, these can be 30, 60,000 feet easily. And the material, again, we don't even know what some of these materials are made out of because we just know Vectran's one of the examples of liquid crystal polymers. There's so many, there's thousands of them that we've worked with in labs that are yeah, more so they interesting. Can, <laughs> they can basically, that's like a ballast control, a very, very lightweight ballast control uh, switch. So the, the idea is, but with balloon technology is you're just basically, it's basically like lift versus drag your overall volume of your craft but it's basically a problem of lift versus weight you know how much weight do you have and how much uh, lift do you have and then you know so your payload here in, in this case is this spy uh this satellite um solar panel array sorry it looks like a satellite it looks like the iss space station or something it's basically it, it really does what it, was it, hanging it, off it, that it's a clone of a CubeSat, from what I could tell. I mean, granted, we've only seen from one angle, but a CubeSat is basically this, you know, you've got an Android run system a lot of the time. It's got solar panels on all sides that can be extended. Um, it's just a simple CubeSat. And these are really easy to manufacture. It's basically like a, a micro PC. Um, they're usually solid state. You might have a Raspberry Pi, you might have another system, but the, the 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 most interesting thing about the CubeSat is that you can have so many different sensors connected to it, like the Arduino microcontroller processing, and so it's able to pick up on where it is, what the weather's like, etc. And and also, okay, so here's the thing I was thinking about Flipper Zero, because we're talking mm -hmm. to Matt here, and Matt's got one of these. So imagine what China's got. This is the cute Japanese version. Like imagine the scary 
um, Chinese version of Flipper Zero. Flipper Zero is this thing that scans all the signals and records them. So, like, let's say here you got one right there. Let's pull up Matt. Oh, I got the add on because I actually oh, have cool. the dev board on it. Wow, that's awesome. So, imagine though, like, if he was, nice. if this was, imagine the evil like version of this and it's in a balloon and it flies over parking lots across Canada and America and stuff and just records how to open people's car doors and people's houses <laughs> and whatever smart you know signals it's got it's able to connect to so i mean that's that's kind of another thing i imagine is coming is uh it's going to be used to record all of you've got all these wi-fi cameras and everything and all these wi-fi access points if it if it goes over the place and i had balloon, i heard rumors that when you know google drives around with their cars and and they they have um yeah Right. They have the camera that rec that does the street view because how do they get the street view pictures? Right, there's a Google car, and I've yeah. seen them driving around. You you know, and if you see it driving around, there's a chances are you can go look up that street view and you'll be in the picture. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, and uh, too. So so they they drive around, but I I heard rumors that they also go and they find unsecure Wi-Fi networks. They find all that and they, and yeah. they keep track of it and they log it all. And, and they have a probably have flipper zero or something like that already. That's what I used Google to do as a kid. So yeah. Growing up yep. in Silicon yep. Valley, I used to have chalk and I would go around and I would mark people's walls when I was like a teenager, 12, like 12 to 10, 12, 13, 14 for Wi Fi networks because Wi Fi was kind of new at the time. And you'd put an X on a wall that had it that needed to be opened and a circle on a wall that had uh, an open network. And you'd put a line through a wall that you'd had the or check mark rather. The, to remove part of the X, if you'd found your way into some network and you'd put it into one of the local BVS boards or, or forums to share. Then today, driving around Santa Cruz, I saw one of these. So Google has these guys. These are these cars that don't have steering wheels. And there's usually somebody like working on his laptop, sitting in this thing as it's driving him around. And yeah, all it takes is going by somebody's house while somebody's logging in or logging out to record the handshake. Right. Because the way all technology works is encryption is is the Masonic secret. Yeah, just like the people engine. that hacked Facebook to realize it was all, all based on these tokens that were exchanged. And, and you basically just record yeah, the so token. I can, I can do and that. Learn how this. to do it. And that's how you open someone's phone. Exactly. Okay, but like, uh, I can do that on this honest, with the, the Chinese, Marauder software. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. The, the Chinese said that this is just a weather balloon. If they wanted to infiltrate our, our, our systems. If they want to infiltrate America, they just use TikTok. Or uh, hardwired uh, security, like bug, like the bugs that are hardwired. All our Chinese uh, manufacturing, you know. You know, there's fax machines that, hey, like, if you copy something too many times, it sends it off to their masters. Look up the uh, Hike Vision. Um, I think the point is that weather function. balloons have always been so the most. All the Hike Vision security cameras are banned from hospitals, government facilities, everything because they're made in China and they were hardwired with a, a chip right on the right on the motherboard of all, all the cameras, the IP cameras, all and all the uh, NVRs that has a call home function that any network time it plug into a network, it tries to call home to China and, and link up with the Chinese network to send data. Um, well, about the, the security cameras and uh, from all hike vision, and uh, they're as a result they're banned in in um, all all hospitals and 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 you know federal. That was facilities. a big thing. So I had some friends who worked at Lockheed uh, when the fires in California hit a couple of years ago, and it was interesting because there had been a big security breach, and the idea that the Chinese had been in the Bay Area and gone through Lockheed and all this stuff, and so what they said was that at the Lockheed building that there was no fire but that the building itself had burned and it was scorched black, like in a square around the building, like it had burned from the inside out to completely destroy anything that was inside the building. So there was a lot of talk about, whoa, what did we get ourselves into? The Chinese have been so deeply entwined with us. And, you know, that then we were, that was during when, who was the president, right? Like somebody who wasn't really super Chinese friendly. And now we have a new, more Chinese allied uh, president who's kind of, you know, by by Compromise. telling Blinken, by telling Blinken not to go or not making these deals, what we're saying is we're not going to defend Taiwan. It's like a very cl clear, consequential path that we're allowing China to do their thing to Taiwan. We're essentially, you know, not we're being neutral on a moving train. So clearly, we're at this point, right, this precipice where uh, that w became a question: Are we or are we not friends with that balloon today? I 
I has Oceania always so, been at war with Europa? You know, I believe it's more so the script always flips whenever it comes to politics. Like you'll see something and I base everything on the news media. Like it, you think it's going to be big and everything is going to be released two years later. That's when it happens. And the script always flips after that. So if we're looking at being friends with China, I think that like the UAPs are actually the Department of Defense of the United States. And if we come into conflict, that's whenever it comes out because no other country is addressing UAPs or anything else publicly except for the United States. And it's just a show of like strength. I, I, feel like, I feel like that with the fact this balloon path, like let's look at the path again. Hold on. So the, the balloon goes uh, yes. around Alaska by Japan. There's no way that this is going beyond Alaska through NORAD without the United States knowing about it. So yeah. at this point, we already know that China and the United States were allied at this point, and Biden was cool with it. Then it goes across Canada. We all know what Canada is doing. We all know Trudeau. Like, it's obviously that they're allied with China. They're not really defending Taiwan. And you, yeah. they sometimes say something, but that's about it. This thing and, flew right over Bernie's house and took pictures of it. We should I saw Bernie on Google Bernie. Maps from that balloon. Dude. Oh, Bernie, my. What were you wearing? God. Uh, you're just going to have to wait to see when they release it, I guess. <laughs> wait for the leak, dude. It'll be on the... It, it will be leaked. Uh-oh. Bernie uh, out in his polar bear suit, maybe. Good old Canadian winter. Uh, there's a lot of speculation that they probably had a LIDAR um, mapping on this balloon. What do, you, what do you think are the possibilities of that, uh, Jeremy or Mark? Well, there's a lot of interesting laser technologies that, that are out there, including um, laser. I mean, you could do that from space. There's no need for that. There was a lot of antennas on it. They can do laser guidance too. This is a path. Okay, so there's um, certain there's certain things you can't do from space. I want to point out if you use lidar. Well, no, you don't have to use my page. I was just gonna say if you use lidar from sixty thousand feet, uh, you can see uh, underground, and so that would be the main reason you would want to be closer is that you could use it for penetrating lidar. Yeah, yeah. So lasers are also you can have laser emitting diodes, which are very lightweight, and it's uh it's much less um. I think it could penetrate the canopy, but it can't penetrate underground. What were they using for the Android? I don't know enough about the these systems that I'm starting. I'm still like learning a little no, bit no, about them. Lidar can penetrate trees because it hits it a bunch of times. It'll get in between the leaves, but it can't penetrate ground. So what they do is they have a system of about twelve, usually different kinds of radio, uh, thirty-five point seventy-five gigahertz radar payload system operating the sixty U cube set for the rain cube design this is kind of the basic way you would you know you would you would you do this that and then you would not, be able to, that is not ground penetrating at those i'm super curious like it, it all depends on what you're what you're looking for and what you're spying on if it's if you're just looking for the weather then you're going to have a, a different set of sensors on it than if you're you know looking to look for underground military bases um and scan <laughs> underground you know right. scan the ground for underground stuff uh, versus, you know, if you're going to put what kind of sensors are we going to put on this thing? If I'm, you know, thinking about as a scientist, it's, it's going to be different. Those are like th those look like 80 megahertz uh, antennas at the end. That would be for communicating and uh, hopping off of the ionosphere for those who have uh, ham licenses. Yeah, yeah, it's probably got so it's some probably OTH like a quarter, horizon. A quarter wave, a 80. Uh, 80 meter it's, antenna. It's it might probably have been a 20 beaming those signals. It's probably collecting data or intelligence. I, I actually then... communicated with somebody on 20 meters from here to Australia once when the uh, conditions were just good. And uh, I, I talked to Israel as well on the same day. So we had, we had uh, the ionosphere charged up and you can bounce signals off of the ionosphere and back. Um, and that's probably how they were communicating with this thing using mm -hmm. uh, either 20 or 80 megahertz. Yeah, Do so clouds that disrupt would that or can they data. Help that? No, the cloud it, it'll go straight through the clouds and when the uh, sun burps, it charges up the ionosphere and that becomes like a mirror for the signal. So you're able to get mm. you're able to communicate past the horizon. Um, sometimes you're able to communicate all the way around the world. Uh, yeah, so this this translates back into Tesla technology on wireless electricity through the ionosphere. So yeah. you can uh, carry your way resonance. Like, Signal not not like through that. against the ionosphere yeah. bounces it off, like yeah. on the barrier of it. it. It acts as a mirror and bounces it off. You see yeah. it pops. 
I think also we it makes me really want to start digging into Montana more because like obviously there's some underground awesome base in Montana. Like that's there's just a obvious. lot of uh, a lot of <laughs> our, out in that area, like those northern states and stuff. There's a lot of missile silos, a lot of ICBM like launch sites because it's a good vantage point to go right over the North Pole to to get to that um, to get to China or Russia. You know, it's a strategic. Uh, position within the u.s and uh, elsewhere and there's a lot of farmland and open space out there too where you'll just be driving along these cornfields out there and then like all of a sudden it's like, oh there we go there's another missile Can silo and it the builds the largest data farm in montana there we go so oh, wait. oh boy so i mean come on I think that that gives you that's like it zettabytes of information truffle pig. Target. send the truffle pig that direction you know that's uh, a target. Wow. Yeah. So then it's no longer. And again, that's it's... more like the Echo Flipper than it is. And it doesn't need necessarily go underground per se. You know. Also, what you have to do is you just have to scan the balloon over. Hopefully, you pick up somebody who lives in the Pine Gap like towns like data. You get into their phone and there's something like that. And then from there, they can get someone else who's on the ground to get in. Because there's so many things here. They have all these different things. They already have data centers here. The Chinese already have companies and apps and things already in the United States. So they just need to work with their tech. I mean, that's what it seems like. Oh, boy. Well, another question is, uh, it looked, or I heard something about there being like small, like little rocket boosters or something like that, or jet things on this, like so that it could uh, alter its, trajectory that way did you guys hear anything about that or what are your thoughts on maneuverability that? form if i was going to engineer a balloon uh, i would not use a, a chemical based propellant like that because it's weight weight for example is one and um you know it takes you know the storage for compressed gas i mean it's like a, it's a lot of uh, weight and stuff so uh i was i was talking about this um back room and get that uh cell it does if it's a cube set it does have Written a really small room. fan on it i don't think the fan's really the pushing plastic, it that like the, the much thing that might the theoretically be there could be a small amount of push just from the fan but also the fact that it's lifting and moving look at the path it followed this isn't like a majorly <laughs> off course path. it's following the natural course yeah you know? it looks like almost lacing in the atmosphere could, could they put elements in the atmosphere that help it travel along easier like, I mean, like yes, I said, it, 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 if you can easily build these things with these liquid crystal polymers and the electric, uh, you know, you, you run a current across it and it shrinks the, the size of the balloon so that it makes it, it will make the balloon go up or down in altitude. Right. Um, so th that's an advantage that's true there. Too. There's Engine. different wind streams at different altitudes. This is exactly why Albuquerque is the choice spot for ballooning because they, they, the wind directions are in opposites and it's right at a perfect height of like, you know, a couple thousand, like a thousand feet. So you just, you know, ride either side of that and you can go back and forth all day. Um, it's, it's real con convenient, but yeah, you can, you could ride these wind currents to a certain degree, but if I were going to do it, I would, I would use like, um, I would use Bifeld Brown effect or these, uh, you know, where you just have a different current, a charge current, uh, electrostatics, which electrostatic propulsion, especially in these wind currents where it's just a long range, slow kind of effect, um, it would it would be uh, advantageous to build this kind of technology and not that hard. I mean, this is off the right. shelf technology. And Meanwhile, Facebook has these, right? Which these things can fly for 18 months at a time. And they're what? gliders. They, once they, they launch them, then they just stay up and they have Wi-Fi. They have basically all the same features as the balloon does. But they're cruising and then they have several flight paths and they're gliding on wind currents. So Wait, is that a prop at the front? You know, or is it that does that have a prop at the front. Glider? It does have a prop at the front, but the prop is powered by the, the ultralights. And, and if they want to rise, they can also ride thermals, just like um, right. falcon, like uh, like birds do to save energy, because birds can soar to you know. Right. There's a really there's a great yes. Disney movie. Have you ever seen the Boy from the Condors? Uh, yeah, this is this is actually Walt, Walt Walt Disney made this movie, I believe, about LRH. But what wow. this is, is the true story of a boy who got into gliders in California. And to pass your gliders test, you had to fly like 500 miles in a glider without an engine. So what they do is they truck tow you and they tow with the truck up. He gets up into the sky. I flew in one once. 
I, I got, the only I got reason this water and flew in one. Yeah. This guy would have died like because feet. like he's going into the fog canyon, but eventually he sees a condor. And he's like, oh, man, they know what to do. So he just follows the condors as they follow the paths. And that way he doesn't crash into the cliff. And true story, flew 500 miles, survived it. And so it became like kind of a, at the time, it was a big deal. <laughs> yeah, there was another movie by Disney that was like this, where he flew the geese home. And he Fly was on away like home. A, like, oh. I don't know if that was a Disney movie, but that is also a pretty weird and important uh, true story. And uh, that involves the UN and seeding um, per- bird preserves on islands in order to take over certain spots in order to create these. But this is what's part of this idea of techno Gaianism. So techno Gaianism is this idea that we can make the world technology all part of the same thing. So natural technology. And so if these things are flying on natural currents and eventually nature can produce the materials themselves, then it becomes part of nature and it's no longer super out there or weird anymore. It just, it, the seeds are being deposited on the wind currents by these robo birds that we're creating. Right. And that is part of nature at a certain level. So, I, I mean, it's not necessarily evil to create these balloons, right? The thing is what, what they're being used for per se, that kind of scares me. When did they stop using balloons to launch satellites? Oh, they still do it, actually. CubeSat balloon launch. I just saw one. They have those many um, nuclear-powered balloons. Space startup aims to launch CubeSats on balloon-lofted rockets. There's a bunch bunch of companies. Leo Aerospace is one of the ones that's been doing it. Um, Yeah, if I go back, I'll find there's more. So what happens to the balloon after they launch it? Are they just launching on lower atmosphere that they have to have the thermal activity up on the gases inside the balloon to keep it up? Um, I think one of the things is that if you launch a balloon to a certain height and then you've got a pressurized chemical fuel, you can launch a rocket from the balloon to get it beyond the distance the balloon can't um, penetrate. Uh, and there's a number of different ways that they've worked on that. There's also this idea of electrostatic tethering that you can produce enough electroionic lift at a certain atmosphere that then you could just use the 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 energy in the ionosphere to propel yourself up once you're already up there. So, you know, but you can launch so graphene, cubes at graphene oh, the, graphene um, space elevator or the graphene space tether. Right, the yes. idea of building a space tether is interesting because. And, you know, the term space, but just basically if you hit the ionosphere with a tether and it's grounded, the amount of energy produced from friction so much that it melts anything that we've ever thrown at it. Like NASA in 1998 put these uh, like super cables that were bigger than uh, redwood trees up and this giant cable and it took like less than, in, I think it was 1.8 seconds and it started to glow so hot, red, white, that it just boiled and snapped in- instantly. And so the amount of energy that you're storing, it's so much more than we've ever dealt with. It's all the energy that humanity's ever used in a second, basically all the time. And we need oh, but free energy of- doesn't <laughs> exist. <laughs> it's just so dangerous also because like we haven't figured out how to capture just some of that. You know, that's the other thing. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I put up a YouTube video just the other day that I was capturing stuff out of the magnetosphere. I don't know. What are we going to do, man? What are we going to do? <laughs> I guess we just have to depend upon oil and war oh, and gee. everything else. Yeah. And taxes. Well, uh, yeah. How much did you end up pulling out of uh, that, Matt? Uh, so I didn't measure the total, but I mean, it was jumping like uh, 110 volts, everything. Dude, a Rife River Pump, too. Yeah, so you can look up the video on uh, Real Rife Technology on my YouTube channel. And Hunter and I did this again. We went up a thousand feet and Hunter, he was wearing gloves this time. He actually got hurt. So we're not doing it anymore. This, this was a really quick video. And one can use a balloon instead of a drone. And then you don't need to actually be using uh, any sort of energy other than the balloon's buoyancy to get to harvest it and work the system. Oh. Yeah. So he's wearing leather gloves. He's got thick insulated shoes. And I, I don't suggest anybody do this because he was actually really scared and I had him ground out and everything. And whenever I'm grounding this, you have to remember I'm grounding to a galvanized 
piece. Uh, this is a clothes hanger, like T shape. I forget what it's called, but it's only like two foot in the ground in sand. And you'll see me stick like the other end of the electrical meter in the ground and it's still doing like the same amount of grounded out. <laughs> All right, I found a cool balloon story right here. These designs are similar to the um, what they use to go on the deep dives in the ocean too. It's interesting because it's the same uh, designer. I don't know how they're interrelated, but. Is this a balloon or a drone? Or uh, is it... This is a drone taking up one of uh, my Royal Rife coils. So it has no open points on it. Everything's sealed off. It's double enameled, and I'm still capturing more energy than what I could with the bare copper net. Hmm. Have you ever guys... I'm probably fast forward a little bit because until I zoom in, it takes a little bit of a minute. They, they built this um, blimp with four helicopters on it. Um, speaking of balloons, it was called the Pesecki Helistat. Um, and they, they built it for heavy lifting so that they could combine the dynamic, you know, buoyancy capabilities of a blimp with the lifting power of a helicopter. So here are the four helicopter bodies on this thing as they wheeled it out uh, for its, you know, this test flight. But it was built to, like, be able to lift really, really heavy payloads for um you know yeah i mean if this is if you think about the size differential here between these and the a cube set i mean at first i was thinking it was kind of silly to suggest this but i said it anyway the fan like the cooling fan on a cube set would operate a bit like a bit of a propulsion system and so or it could give you some glide or rotor motors on it right like the old zeppelins and stuff how they were able to steer them well they, they probably have right four they, they probably have four propellers if it's a cube set because that's the you know that's the system for how it keeps itself cool so but the way it would work is the air is pulled in so as the air is pulled in it would be pushed out the back of it so that would give it a bit of a propulsion yeah, I mean, it's pulling it in from the front, too, which is drawing it up. Well, oh, there it crashes. Oh, well, yeah. That way, you, that, and the Ooh. idea here is to make sure you oh. don't accidentally think that it makes sense for you to have free energy. Because if you used a balloon, then that'd be crazy. Yeah, but I mean, look at the mechanical structure of this. Why, why are they leaving it so blank on the back end when they know it's going to be pulling forward and it's going to have yeah, this draw was a horrible on the design head. of how they mounted those yeah well that. that it was, feels yeah. like they messed it up on purpose but i don't know i was just about to ask that like some people are dumb i mean it's pot the thing i have to remind myself is like so i met a lot of people that are that work in engineering that aren't really brilliant so it's well, totally I mean, possible <laughs> they rewind that, that a little bit and watch how all four of them fall at the same time yeah like yeah just that does all right, Rife, you know what, though? That's interesting because it's like it's so screwed up synchronistically. Uh, it's it so almost perfect. Feels like perfectly wrong. Yeah. It's the perfect storm. God. Similar looks to the so uh, Hindenburg up. disaster. Almost. Yeah. Well, Hindenburg disaster was the diesel engines, right? So that was an even. Oh, really the thermite good. paint on the, on the, on the, um, the hull. You know, they painted yeah. it with that aluminum paint and it had like the, uh, you know, the aluminum particles in it, then aluminum nanoparticles for the paint. And uh, in the right, like the iron um, oxides. Lest we forget the the, the uh, Sonora Air Club, right? So in the 1800s into the early 20th century, there were all of these Germans that were working on these airships designs, and uh, the Sonora Air Club was building airships all across America. And you can find um, the Nimza group, right? And Nimza people that were building airships and you know, newspaper reports, like someone landed in their experimental airship in Kentucky in 1811 someone lands in 1790 and so it's just it's constantly more airships than we're ever told we're always like oh there's not that many airships it must have been this crazy that, experiment 1790 haven't you ever heard of the wright brothers that was like 1800s they were the right. first people to create flight yeah and that was also funny for um ripley's believe it or not because ripley got in trouble because someone said oh the first person to fly across the atlantic it's like don't you mean the 39th and you know because he's also maybe he's uh he, and if you maybe if you count 41st person he said first man 
but there were women on the zeppelin before that and he shows like 20 30 years earlier zeppelins have been flying back and forth flow twice now this is a different design if you go back you'll see six blades on these on those helos another thing is those the and zeppelin, that's u.s navy and the other one's u.s forest service the a difference between a balloon airship and a zeppelin is a zeppelin refers to a the name of the original zeppelin designer but also the metal frame so there's a metal frame inside of this balloon that's keeping it shaped and that that's the main difference yeah, yeah the rigid body versus the, the fl inflatable but the thing there. is these differences matter so much less now because you can make materials that bend like brace wire right out of plastics so you basically can build mm. the framage into the plastics now yep you, you could have a you could have a briefcase with a zeppelin in it <laughs> <laughs> Can we do that? Someday. Yeah, for sure. Out of graphene and some sort of a, a, a really thin film. I don't know if, it, yeah, could you do it? Like, would that be enough to lift lift you? Because, yeah, I mean, you could definitely, yeah. the size of it and the ultralight quality, the main question would be also, you you often you want some James displaced. Bond, dude, you just go to the rooftop and open my briefcase and fly away. But you well, need some displaced density. What? So 125 aim. pounds below you don't have to have a pilot's license is that what it is right yeah and also if you don't have an engine is a thing about experimental gliders so not having an engine is really useful because you could really just have shoes with like something on them <laughs> a map showing the general locations of the minutemen three silos in the united states so right over where yeah. all that balloon was yeah that's what i was saying the minute the minutemen silos um, and how did it take them getting all the way into montana for norad to like find it and identify it if it's i feel like it had who discovered it first was it the... did norad point it's it out stinky. or was it some like freedom like uh some sovereign citizen people in montana that looked at it I don't and think it probably was UFO different. people. Then they yeah. were like, uh, you know, uh, are we going to, I think Biden, Biden was going to let it happen because China does what they want to do. And we just let it happen because we're supposed to have these relationships and the scientific community is supposed to transcend military and we're sharing information and we're pretending that they give us disclosure of the information that they collect. And well, if you look at the latest, um, like the press briefing by the U S military, they said, well, where is this balloon? He said, I'm not going to give you an hour by hour, but I'll give you like a general location. He said, but if people really want to know, people have the freedom to look up so they could obviously see the balloon. Yeah, like it was it was visible the entire time with the naked eye. That's what blows my mind is like hmm. the claim that it came across the ocean and like through what Oregon or Washington or even British Columbia, Canada, it wasn't identified at all through all of that. And then made it into Montana before all of a sudden it's spotted and becomes an issue. Like that just, that, that doesn't fly with me. Well, what does fly are Chinese spy balloons. Well, I know, I know it's been said before, but I just wanted to like make sure the harp harp on the point the japanese weather balloons because our introduction to world war ii really centers around the japanese balloons that threaten the american sky which was like not real first there were lanterns that were probably made by the u.s government and they pretended the japanese kids were sending lanterns across the sea just to make us feel the imminency of a world threat when you're just so isolated from any problem and then from there the japanese balloon which might have been real but i mean what exactly were they collecting with the Japanese balloon? It just seems kind of like a suspicious story. And it flew over the skies of Montana in 1944. So Matt had said something like, it kind of reminds me of a ritual. Like, okay, here we are oh. at that schedule again. We're back to the Montana balloon story. Yeah, it's the same tricks yeah. over and over and over again, kind of like the passports in 1980. And also Cuban Missile Crisis upon nuclear. Well, let's war. go back a little ways to World War II, where there was an Asian balloon that floated over um, Los Angeles and was fired upon by, you know, anti-aircraft guns and our military. Uh, all the spotlights of, um, you know, Beverly Hills and, and where, where 
brought yeah, this out. This is a weird one, the Battle of Los Angeles. Yeah. So what the heck do you think? Because like Mark was talking about this. Well, the military said was? it was a balloon. I mean, so I mean, a weather balloon. Out. This is are we back to the Men in Black thing again? I mean, it was an it was a Japanese spy balloon that you what's know, this, is uh, what's bullet, it bulletproof. What's it called? I mean, or is wait, it, it was bulletproof? No, I'm just kidding. This, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> It sounds think how ridiculous that sounds. Come on now. What did they but that's the question is like what did what they think it? this Japanese spy balloon is supposed to be collecting? What kind of data do they think this Japanese spy balloon is getting? Is it sending it back? Or it just seemed to me like they're pretending it's a Japanese balloon, it could be something else. It's just crazy. And this is years a couple years before um the Japanese balloon. UFOs. So it feels it feels yeah, look at that. What is it? What are we looking at here? That well, looks like a disc craft to me. I mean, it would take mm -hmm. a lot of time in that time period to be able to set up spotlight to go into the same angle to, like, the latitude and longitude to light that up. Pretty crazy, man. And these are the pictures we get of it, which are kind of uh, not That's a lot. It's more intimidating than the one that we are seeing today. That's for mm. sure. I mean, it's I way know, better of a trick. I I'd rather have the identified Chinese spy satellite balloon, you know, with balloon oh, yeah. thingy, uh, that, than this. Sure. For these sure. things showing up, man. I mean, the fact is, you know, and you know this more than anybody, Jeremy, is that the laser guided balloon system that's coming, like projectors on balloons. I don't know why I'm finding these cute party balloon tricks, but oh, like that military, will that balloon. help? Like this one, they're like, ah, oh, the military can't shoot it down because they can't shoot it down. Uh, but the, the the new spy balloon, they can't shoot it down because they don't want to damage it. They want to capture it intact. Um, so that was the you know that's the big problem with uh, them trying to you know intercept these balloons so that we can you know and what they really want to be able to do is intercept the balloon and all, and send bad intelligence back somehow. Camouflage you know? technology, though. I mean the the kinds of things we've seen like the invisible jets and everything else. Yeah, Stefan. Jean Picard was a Swiss high altitude balloonist whose wife may have been the first woman in space. Star August Trek, Picard. Picard. Yeah, for sure. August Jean Luc Picard is, is named after him. Jean is Jean Picard is the one that went deepest in the sea in the Challenger oh. in 1948, I think. 1931 is August Picard who went the highest in the atmosphere. But yeah, both the whole Picard family, the Swiss Picards, are insane in their research in atmospheric and deep ocean. Thank you, Stefan. Yeah, they're they're my favorite uh, balloon people. But yeah, cool. Mm. Glad your people know about that stuff. Wow. Yes, the Brilliant. video. They have videos of his uh, his uh, first like his big flight. I mean, like, if they can project though from the, from the sky any sort of uh, visuals, and they can hit clouds with lasers and project anything then you don't need to see anything that's above anything it's moving super fast and so any of these balloons are basically invisible and innocuous that they can stick around for a long period of time and they can just sort of record everything going on that's the, the best way for them to have access to all of your your data yeah because i mean the chinese have the subsonic missiles that can go all the way around the globe but it's not stationary in one period. So if you know you can do zero day attacks or anything else and collect all kinds of data. There is a really interesting conspiracy theory about the subterranes, which is that the Soviet Union did build, and this part's true for sure, subterranes, which are these drills, and they embedded them into the California coastline. But the story goes that they've lost track of them, don't have control of them anymore, and that there's just a number of nuclear warheads that have been drilled into the California coastline, just kind of abandoned from the 70s and 80s. Oh, I've never heard this. Hmm. So are really? these like drilling? Like, Are they like on the San Andreas Fault? Like, right Yeah. Yeah, totally. And it's like the idea is like we, they didn't have enough future in nukes, and they were trying to come up with a be-all, end-all, like, hey, just stop it kind of a thing. Um, but then the Soviet Union kind of collapsed, and so they don't necessarily have control over some or ways to access some of these anymore. They're just there. But there's also the Soviet, like Soviet San Bruno, California. Like if, in San Bruno, California, they brought 
tons of Soviets, uh, and there's been always there's always like terrorist attacks, houses blowing up, crazy spy espionage things going on because um, deadly gas explosions, right? Because the Soviets were brought in, they said, "Hey, if we don't bring them in, then the the Afghani's or the you know the Saudis are going to get them. So we have to pay to bring the Soviet citizens uh, scientists into and, and keep them somewhere, and they brought them here, and what? it's." Yeah, so there's just a ton of Soviet scientists that end up in San Bruno, and uh, it's right by the airport in San Francisco. And there's supposed to be underground tunnels and drills. It's a major area for underground. So the idea that the Soviets have been there and they have control of this underground access point in San Bruno. Oh, God, Elon Musk is messing up then. Oh, and that's also where there is a boring company, like one of the first boring company things in San yeah. Bruno. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's uh, sketchy. All right, so um, are you got any more balloon stuff left, or anything? Anything left for balloons? Because I'm gonna, I'm about to wrap, uh, wrap up my stream. I think we covered a lot. Kind of, we nerded out on balloons hard for an hour, and uh, uh, I learned a lot. I'm sure our audience has learned a lot from from all this. And um, I'd like to know your thoughts on them using a missile to shoot it down, as opposed to just like their, uh, like a gut the whatever type of gun the F-22 has, but like some sort of machine gun, like bullets or whatever. Why would they use a um, air to air missile just to pop a balloon? And we need to net it in or, or capture it. Oh, I thought we scared all the girls off. There she is. Uh. <laughs> Brittany's still here. <laughs> I think they just want to downplay technology all the time. They're like, we'll just pop a balloon in front of people because that's how dumb people are. We literally just, they have no idea what's going on. They think there's a balloon above them. They're worried about the balloon. Pop the balloon. Problem solved. Like, it's just, it's so weird how dumb the world can be. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, well, and just, that's it's cool. Actually, thinking about the people that actually were in the manned balloon flight. So they obviously made it so that they could just you know be unmanned but to uh, it's exciting and the woman balloon played it, it looked well, large whatever. enough that uh, it could like legitimately carry someone or like someone could stay in a pod on it or something like that you know uh, like well also the cubes balloons sets. are like the three school buses um, there's something with and rolex watches too by the way sorry with, with the the research and funding it for the atmospheric and deep ocean dives too if you look in not right now but just your viewers if they look into like the commercials and um promotion of picards and doing that stuff so something sun with the sensor rolex watch and, wind sensor uh, all the different sensors it's like so you don't even need people because you've got these machines they can see things they can hear things measure things uh and you pop one balloon and how many thousands i think there's sixty thousand loons and you think the chinese didn't make that material i'm pretty sure there's more balloons out there and not only that but you can go to chat gpt and program an Ar arduino to do all this right this is basically yeah. what a cubesat is is built on the arduino system so it's all open source and you can plug in and play you can build your own and yes the easiest way to launch it is in a rocket it's a balloon and then you can get this stuff to a certain elevation where even without the balloon with electrostatic, it should just stay up there. So yeah. that's the other interesting thing is that there yeah. probably are more of these are just floating around. I'd like point. to yeah. build ones with like a power cell that you could power, but you know, um, basically it fly it around with electrostatics, um, like by Brown effect. Wow. You know, that would um, be yeah. There's the, these crystal salt was it the nuclear battery nuclear um oh, you they, see the battery we made they're recycling these batteries oh. by taking um oh yeah so nice. you can put Ooh. uh you, you put a p fluids in there and the ph gradient uh, across there will create a voltage uh, just from um a differential in ph so um Very yeah you nice. can just you can 3d what? print this and uh nice wow can you explain um, this a little bit more like what's your uh, catalyst in the middle um, I'll go into that uh, um, a little bit later behind the scenes, so because uh, okay, but um, yeah, yeah, you can build these. There's, 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 I think there's a video out there on it, but yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you about how how the construction of it and, and go into it a little bit more, but not right now. Um, 
Yeah. Um, we're gonna. I'm gonna jump off here, guys, and end for sure. Up. I'll end it on your channel. Uh, Zerdis, you still down for going for another hour? On uh... yeah, we can go a little bit longer. Let's do it. Okay. And then um... Jeremy, though, it's an awesome. I'm glad you're here. Much, Thank you. Much yeah. love, Thank Jeremy. Nice to you, Jeremy. Uh, everyone over at Spot. Falcon Space and uh, next Saturday, Jeremy, we're on for with the Hutchinsons for the crystal battery cells, or what day would work best for you next weekend? Um, I will keep you posted on that for right now. Um, I, I have to see because I'm coming. I'm coming back on Friday. Okay. So um, we'll figure that out. Um, sure. It'll be one of the days next weekend. Yeah, one of the days next week, and 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 uh, I gotta get some. Uh, I want to do more with um, the right. We gotta do more like into this rife technology and and some of these um, experiments on that. And looks get like really, it's coming now. Yeah, we're about to be doing it. Yeah, uh, here. Jeremiah actually got the gold unit today, and I was talking to him on the phone for a bit. Andreas, I don't know if yours got delivered. I can check right. it really quick if you'd like. Um, Brittany's going to go to the post office and make sure. Or did you yeah. go to the P.O. box? And uh, we'll see. I we'll thought it was it. coming to I'll, um, I'll just say if it was David. delivered to the address oh. or not. But I know I Jeremiah him a link got link to join. I, I sent him a link to join. Maybe he'll join after yeah, I after Jeremiah's I, probably I got that, that all ready to go. He, I check hope. your email, Jeremiah, well, and join up. Yeah, hopefully. You meet text. So, uh, should I end it on your channel now? Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna close it down. Thank you for watching, guys. On Jeremy Reese. Um, yep. And it's still live on Crypto Alchemist and on Zerdis cool. channels, which Sweet. I'm posting in the live chat. And it is about to end on Alien Scientist. Um, Make sure you guys subscribe to Alien Scientist and also exactly. we'll be back to talk more with Jeremy. I want to get to talk to you more about molten salt nuclear batteries because i think it's interesting the idea of uh you take the recycled yeah, nuclear batteries. salts man delivered Shake from porch andres yeah okay great nice. so yep. david's this should be i think is where you sent that um okay wait to question david? We to, we'll check so the address on afterwards. Yours. sweet and Okay. Still live on Fairness, Crypto Alchemist, and now also on my Burn Eye. Uh, I believe. I have a question uh, too. Once we get back about the response to the balloon and the military, like, have they have given a reason to why they haven't shot it down? They, they have shot it down now. Oh, they okay. claim yeah. they didn't want to hurt anybody or okay, risk anybody's safety over the land, but. Uh, the area is pretty this is a pretty fun thing. The uh, chilling Soviet maps of San Francisco, likely for co communist oh. takeover, they mapped all of San Francisco, all of the secret, uh, all the factories, all the open and secret places, military bases, uh, military uh, intelligence, corporate contracted data centers, sheriffs, uh, the IBM infrastructure for AT and T, whatever, all of it, and they had planned to, if they needed to, know exactly where everything is. Um, even then China has even better maps than this because they have maps of all of the Wi-Fi addresses so, and everybody who has a Huawei device in their house. Right. Okay. So if this they was shot down the balloon and, and they actually, they found the, um, the boy and a boy inside of it. <laughs> what? What? Um, no, I'm just kidding. This is the balloon boy. Uh, the balloon that'd be, boy. That'd be such oh a 1982 God. kind of movie. I want to see that movie though. We found the boy. Hey, I'm having the boys, so I can. The boy and his balloon. Instead of the boy, the boy and his balloon. Boy and his balloon. Is a Chinese spy balloon. Starring John Travolta's. Um, wait. Oh, this November. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. <laughs> That's hilarious. You got me. I was like. It, that was Bernie and the boy. Feasible. <laughs> Word. So, but okay, nuclear salt batteries, you shake them and then it causes a chemical reaction which releases everything out, right? So that's the idea. That if it shakes everything up, then it produces energy and that should last for like a thousand years. And you shake it again and you get another thousand years. And you could, you could do this probably for tens of thousands of years with the AA battery because it has just a little bit of molten salt that was used in uh, a nuclear reactor, right? And it should work, actually. I mean, as far as I can tell, this is enough to actually hold electricity and to cause new electricity. Hey, Julie. What kind of clearance up? would you have to have to build? Welcome them? back, Julie. Uh, hey, Julie. That's a good question. I, I mean, because, you know, you'd have to get access to, like, molten salt, uh, a toxic waste. 
So if you know a guy in Norway, right? Isn't where are they doing the uh, mm-hmm. the um, nuclear waste storage? Is it Norway or Finland? No, a guy there's, in Iceland. Is that close enough? Uh, in the Netherlands, they have it too. They have they have uh, one in the United States too. A lot of yeah. Nuclear but they're building. Places. They're you building one. Um, Scandinavia. Where is it? Finland. I knew it was gonna be Finland. Holy uh, crap. So Finland built this thing. I want to get the pictures because the pictures will really just blow your mind. Um, Deep. They built these giant places all underground. It's supposed to hold most of the world's nuclear waste. They're gonna. It's gonna be like the world's dump for nuclear waste. And uh, oh, they're gonna dig up that that one at the uh, atoll there, the um, the dome. The world's first permanent nuclear waste repository. Oh yeah. wow. Yeah, First? so it's the tomb. Are you did you, uh, you ever, well, did you ever watch that movie, The Keep? This is like awesome gothic, like horror, late like 80s Bauhaus kind of like synthesizer wave horror film. It's amazing. It, it's, it's, uh, they go to this little village in like some Slavic country in World War II, the Nazis, and they're like, we're going to take your village. And then they're like, you can do what you want, but just stay out of the keep. A mountain, it's called the keep. We don't, we don't go into the mountain. It's like, you cannot tell us what to do. We will do what we want. And then they go in anyway. It's like, you don't understand. It's like, it's not that we're keeping you out. We're keeping it in. And it starts, it's just like horrifying portal world that opens up. That's in this like underground abyss that's connected through the gates of the nether lounge, you know, and you get there through a hole in the mountain into like emptiness. Right. But that's basically mm. the same thing building this giant infinite corridor to put nuclear waste that no humans ever supposed to go again and there'll be a machine uh, that lowers it like an elevator that, that wow. sounds like the earth's constipation point uh, that like don't go in there you're going to release every kind of evil that's coming out that we've stored for years sounds like Cthulhu. the balrog yeah at the base of mordor i mean uh nuclear Dude, who is approving all of this? Why are people oh, yeah, not like, able to say anything about it? And how close is it to the uh, particle accelerator that uh, is in Chicago, like CERN? Dude, 85,000 metric tons of fuel, of nuclear fuel, has been, has been produced by the U.S. alone since the 1950s. Mm-hmm. We have about 80 sites. You know, the amount of money that they're going to make being able to store this stuff. I mean, Finland's looking at making a lot more money than Norway's making off oil. I'm just going to make a prediction. In 100 years, Finland's going to be lit up like a light bulb, and that's where all of our energy is coming from. That's the thing I imagine. So, wow, look at this. This is crazy. So they build this crazy. Look at this. If you had a demon and you had to trap it, this is probably how you would do it. You'd put it into this crazy Minecraft level and you just, holy cow. And then machines would bring it. Oh man. Yeah. And then salt reactors will just store it forever. Also, um, the Brittany, you mean Fermi labs, the one outside of Chicago. Oh, wow. We have a super chat. Uh, yeah, Stephen. Stephen. Some Let me throw stuff in cards in have here. small squares of authentic game used uniforms. I have an alien Allen and Ginter baseball card with a small piece of the multi layer foil from Balloon Boy. Oh, alien Gonzalez. Did I read that right? <laughs> yeah, you read that right. Athlete. Alien Gonzalez. Elian Gonzalez. Uh, alien Gonzalez um, sounds like a little bit. <laughs> Also, I think it's just a different pronunciation. We don't have the like the first the thing Andreas was saying about the first nuclear storage waste site because there's New Mexico has um, also like I'm just wondering what they're identifying as the first site where they're storing it because we've been storing nuclear waste since the beginning of nuclear energy, right? So the um, yeah, there's the waste isolation pilot plant, the WIP in new mexico too which is interesting but it's it's like we're just storing it all over the place and i think um yeah we could have yeah, ancient the, technology that's also been the, the neutralization stored. of all of this nuclear waste is super easy i think that they're lying to us well and you can reuse it you can also um 
bomb certain places and speed up decay or change the 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 element itself and then use it again i was looking into that using um different types of bombs in places where they found uranium deposits to make it more pure by yeah it's an interesting science but that's like your army corps of engineers that get to do that and nobody else really gets to learn about uh the mechanism i don't think but it's, it is fascinating i think you're you're onto something with that because they're refining it uh, um and yeah, I mean, the ways. just the simple neutralization is really easy can you go into that a little bit more of what you're saying because this might be linked to so the the radiation point of nuclear waste you can neutralize it just by um diluting everything that's in it and it'll be able to spread it out to where it's not even um like to the high levels of radiation for cancer production or anything else so what you can you... use it to help compost you can use it to help do many different things because it is energy it's energy being released and any kind of energy where you break it down you can subsection it into different categories and if so you're using different solvents to make I freaked out my or... brother earlier when i explained to him that energy drink comes from radion water radium water yeah so, I mean, just like this radium water. Okay, let's take um, iodine, for example. You can take iodine pills and you drop them into a five milliliter bottle of water. It's only going to release so much, right? So, if you take that and, you know, people will drink. Oh, they took them out. Now they're like, no! that's the limit. That was the limit. They shut you down. They're like, oh, keep going. Oh, you're muted. You're Are muted you lost even. your audio somehow, Matt? Ladies and gentlemen, don't drink radium water. They they stopped the radium water. Get another energy drink that gives you wings. Yes, definitely don't. Not recommended Western. drinking anything that glows in the dark or that is radioactive. Just saying. Testing yeah. one, two. Yeah, this is got you back. at low volumes. Right. Yeah, so... Diluting uh, nuclear waste with different different mechanisms is where we were at, I believe. Yeah, okay. So if you... Uh, let's take energy, for example. Uh, you, have a you have a storm rolling in that has positively charged ions in the air that causes, um, you know, a lot of atmospheric excitement. You can change those positively charged ions into negative and you can fight against it. So the same thing is happening with the nuclear waste. You can spread this out over a period of like acidic soil and you can put this on it and it's going to change it to like a more neutral pH balance. Can you also repurify then um, by adding different things if you've already had expunged waste? Like, can you make uranium more pure by? doing something to it after it's been used i'm just wondering um yeah you have magnetism also electromagnetism can pull yeah i'm not really too sure on that andreas would be more familiar i mean okay, part of the thing is like you can either consume the energy or you can move the energy right you can either like find a th sort the energy consume the energy move the energy so certain things like mushrooms or livestock, the Codex Alimentarius talks about putting nuclear waste in human food product and livestock product because uh, you can naturally digest and process nuclear radioactive waste. And so cattle can do that. Um, if you look at the, I wish Lance was here, the Chinese maps of agriculture. I don't think I can find this just like that quickly. But if you do look at this map, and it, I wish I could get the subtlety of this map plus Chinese map of nuclear waste um, or nuclear production, you'll find that these places are um, congruent with each other. So they put the rice in the rice that they're selling to you in America and the rice on Bolivia and things like that. A lot of that rice is organic, but it's grown in nuclear uh, waste zones where it's being used to process uh, the nuclear waste naturally. Yeah, and, and that's I mean, how they're helping to compost <laughs> the soil. They're creating soil out of nuclear waste because right. energy Which cannot be created nor destroyed. And you use that energy to be able to take something 
that's desolate and that's in the doldrums and put energy into it and it becomes liveliness for other things. Now, I don't like know if that transfers foods. into organic, like, yeah, food you get growth. like super tomatoes and like giant avocados and stuff when you're growing it. Not, in as, radio, not necessarily, but there is. Well, so one of the things that they do, for instance, is bananas, mutations, radiation. Mm -hmm. They're doing so the, in, the, in order to rapidly produce. <laughs> new bananas that can be resistant to fungus what they do is they use radio radiation to rapidly mutate the banana sequences in order to evolve bananas in a way that would take usually tens of thousands of years for nature to do theoretically whatever we understand that to be but that's also probably what happens every time a volcano goes off in polynesia is that it causes bananas in that area to change a lot rapidly so if you look at bananas in general and we've done this before varieties there, there are bananas that are just friggin' amazing, pink, blue, purple, whatever. Some of them look okay. like flowers or watermelons because of radiation. It doesn't mean they're going to necessarily become bigger, but it will change something. So like, let's say a um, radiated silk worm. Uh, I don't know Could if I can you find this. Use coils, bomb... though, to increase the growth of a banana, like how Jeremiah is using coils to regenerate life well, from dead stuff. I just wanted to show, like, so this is a, this is a silkworm. And so silkworms are no. kinds of moss. What? And so if you start, if you start finding, I've seen radiated silkworms that are huge, like let's see if I can find a giant. Um, and so literally as big as a bat I've seen. Uh, and usually they're supposed to be the size of a fingertip, but because of radiation, you can see some of these things have grown super large. Um, like, Why uh, are they giant, called silkworms and not silk moths then? Or what? Well, Do um, they change names? Because well, they... metamorphosis, you know. And, like I know, but when they metamorphosis, it's really called, they call it's really called a bomb. It's really called a bombix mori. A bombix okay. mori is the name of the the animal, and it goes okay. through metamorphosis when it becomes the moth. But uh, we think of it as a silkworm because for thousands of years we've been using it to make silk as a worm, and we don't really care about it as a moth. And um, moths eat our clothes; they don't I make do. our silks, you know. I love the Bombix Mori. The Bombix Mori is my seen. spirit animal, probably. One of my spirit animals. I need to get that helmet for like Halloween next year. I'm going to be a Bombix yeah, Mori. Oh, that was cute. Think, that was adorable. I always used to think like oh. if I were to become like a superhero, because, you know, of course, I, yeah. that's the kind of thought I'm thinking about. But if you were like a Power Ranger or Batman or something like that, right? I would be Bombix Mori. Come on. Because you yeah. could get like the Power Ranger helmet and wow, it'd be sweet. That's so really Wow. <laughs> anyway radiation can make that happen uh let's see radiated um uh, worm or caterpillar at least you can find it no giant so i think we uh, and galen windsor said he swam in a nu in nuclear waste in a nuclear waste pool yeah i mean the idea of these things that used to be giant also like some kind of dna releasing their giant dna again that would be kind of that does happen to some extent, but we haven't seen anything like the Godzilla movies yet. Really. Jeremiah's going to do it with coils, I bet. Just don't let him get any animals on those coils if he's like <laughs> regenerating life. Right now I he's doing basil. To ask him. I know I want to ask him, like, have you put an insect on there? Have you made there, like there is a lot of thoughts that like, so where this does happen, of course, is underwater. Mothra. When you get down to the, yeah, Mothra for sure. But when you get down to the sea, you know, there's nothing stopping things from growing different sizes. There's no bone structure in a lot of these things like the squid, similarly. And uh, there's radiation and heat coming out of these volcanic submarine openings. So things that just never leave these zones become super huge, right? Because they're, they're super fauna and they never leave, right? Nothing ever get, things just fall to them at this level. And so they just, they just stay there. Yeah. So I did a study. Uh, I grew up in the Appalachian Mountains, and it was an old wives' tale. Like, if you look at the worms that come out, it'll tell you if you're going to have like six months or six weeks of winter, or six hmm. weeks of uh, um, I forget what they call it in summer. I was just trying to find it, but it's the color of the worm. It's like black, brown, black, or all black. That would tell you, you that. So I did a study of well, not himself. your guys' groundhog because he just passed away right before he was getting ready to perform his duty. Dude, it was like he Elvis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> but, got too proud. Yeah, it was kind of like the groundhogs of the Appalachian Mountains, but it, I think it's through radiant energy because they could tell the energy that's coming about so that they had to have black to be able to keep more heat in. 
because black's attracting all the different colors and all the frequencies of the sun versus the black brown black. Dude, groundhogs are terrifying. Imagine like the ancient giant groundhogs. Basically just a sloth, man. Horrible. Yeah, it is. Man. Where is this like next to a person? God, I don't want to deal with that. Can you imagine? It's the worst thing. I used to have a pet. But they're basically groundhog. marsupials. I mean, okay, if it's small, it's fine. I can deal with that. Yeah. A small ground. You had well, you had to get it when tall? it was a baby and it had its eyes closed still. So that when it, you're you're the first thing it saw. How big the daughters ever get? I feel like the when they went to the deepest depths of the uh the Mariana Trench, they saw something. Because there's an image of when they got there. I, or otherwise there's like things cracking, but I'll try and send it. It's pretty um horrifying. So I know we were just talking about that, but in extreme elements, you get extreme creatures, it seems. Well, touching back on the radiant energy thing, this is what I believe in, like, the waveform of gravitational pull that had the Nobel Prize presented in, what, 2017, 2018? That if you look up the coral reefs all around the world, they only release sperm one night out of the year and it's not the same night every year it could be two weeks off or a month off or anything else but all like they speak to one another just like a garden does just like a plant that's growing too large and another one needs nutrients it'll supply nutrients to that plant to grow higher so this is radiant energy through the earth and this is what helped me work upon you know like the wireless electricity theory of nikola tesla and dr you know or um parkenstein he beat me to it, but it's still the same theory. It's all radiant energy. Right, and, and that's what it is, is collecting the different radiant energies because we're literally immersed in a sea of different universal radiant energies. And therefore, this free energy isn't energy out of nowhere. It's not uh, breaking any of the law, thermal laws of, or laws of, thermal dynamics it's just being more um productive with what is in there like what's around and more efficient with our current devices and using the energy that is everywhere yeah and if you look up the first law of thermodynamics it says that you're not going to get more energy output of what more energy that you put in. as much energy as you put in is what you're going to get on out so it is radiant energy. Energy is not created nor destroyed within our own atmosphere. And this is why we can collect all of this energy that's around us, but we're subjected through different rules and regulations that we're not allowed to do it. Okay, so the work put in is the exchange of heat and friction and everything else, and that's the only output of energy you're going to get. So however much energy you expend putting in is what your result's going to be. So this goes back to perpetual motion, but what's that? I'm just saying that's so kind of true with everything. Continue. So the perpetual <laughs> motion machine, this is actually, and you know, I, I, know that there's a way to make a mechanical physics will to be able to do perpetual motion because we do have gravitational pull. Just like if you take PoE coils and you wind them uh, counteractive to one another to where you put them on top of each other, but you bury them up underneath ground to where gravitational pull is pulling more energy in that toroidal field that you can have it keep on going. Just like what um, Roden was trying to do but he never perfected it. So if he would have used gold as my theory, because gold on the uh, Gauss like magnetic meter is like 80 micro Tesla or something above ground, but it drops down to exactly half below soil. So soil is the energy, and then we have the gravitational pull that's affecting it as well. Brittany, what's this? You pulled this up. That's the deep dive. They look a little horrified. Sorry. That's what I was bringing up earlier. This is um, Jacques Picard, uh, the uh, son of the man that went the highest in atmosphere, designed this. And uh, when they got there, I think it was because they said the uh, 
glass was cracking, but it seems like they had maybe seen some type of crazy, like the abyss, hence the movie Cthulhu. is about these this experience, I think, but just my speculation. And then no one went that deep until James Cameron, which is also interesting. Did you see James Cameron's acid trip yet? Did you guys all watch that? Yeah, it was nuts. He did this Actually. video in the 80s, I guess, where he talked about taking acid and uh, several it's cool. times. He talked yeah, with his about wife five and stuff different and experiences. One time, yeah, like good. he's like, "Man, I really shouldn't have thrown water into the fire with my face right above it." It's you know, kind of a thing. <laughs> but um, but there were yeah. bullets in the fire from a, a yeah, it was not story. I randomly yeah. watched that like two days ago, but and I think I shared that in your Discord too. I hadn't yeah, seen pretty it. interesting. The wife that made the Hurt Locker that won the Oscar for the Hurt Locker. Probably, I don't know. James Cameron or what? James Cameron. He, he got um, to take the Challenger. He got to like make his own. He married little... five times, so I'm not yeah. sure which wife is the one. He got to go to the Mariana Trench too. I thought, didn't he? Probably the one that was in Terminator. I don't know. Linda I'm Hamilton. Sure. Isn't there is that the same guy? The guy with the beard and the guy shaven? Yeah. Yeah. James Cameron, man. James Cameron Young. Young James Cameron. He's the Avatar James, guy. James yeah. Cameron with Botox and yeah. with uh, stem cell Did he do research Abyss, and... too? Right? Yeah. Or who Did is he do Abyss? He sh- I don't know. He should have, because he got to do it. He's like that guy. Who is it? Who, made Abyss. who directed Abyss? It can't be James Cameron. That's, like, too old. James Cameron. Yeah. James Cameron. No. James Cameron. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like this... the cards. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> I mean, you know, he wanted to be an engineer or scientist or an explorer or something like that. He had all the money and all the access to all the anything he wanted to do. And so that's why he's obsessed with like 3D movies and everything. He's like, I just want to have access to whatever everyone else doesn't. That's his whole. That's fair. It's a fair goal. But wouldn't it be like NASA or the military that should have that that record after the Picard's son? Like, you know. It just seems bizarre that James Cameron gets to be the next person that gets to go that that. Day. He has the money. He built the thing, right? He financed the the whole thing, so yeah. I think that's the way that works. You money gives paid. you access to resources. Resources gives you access to depleting the rules, right? Did Stefan make it? Stefan, what's up? He's gonna lose it. Loading, loading. There it is. He did it. What's You're up, welcome. bro? Welcome. Oh, this is a nice look. I like this. This is good. This is a good look. What's up, bro? How's it going? We're talking about field energy, free energy, stolen energy, um, perpetual energy, first law of thermodynamics. I never know which one's. I never know High which energy. is the British curse word. It's all of them. Oh, it's forwards versus backwards. That's a good. That's a good random thing to bring up. Um, peace sign backwards, Britain. You guys know this, right? In America, uh, they told they told you not to put your fingers either direction because this is uh, the fu. And I don't know how true this is, but I love the story anyway. That uh, it's about your bow fingers because they were saying, "Hey, look, Gales or Janissaries, we still have our bow fingers." So you, you didn't cut them off yet because they used to cut off the fingers of the, the archers. So it was threatening? Might not be true, but that's a story. Open I is okay. It's like, taunting. It's like hey, hey, I still got them. You know? yeah. But that's why they told American soldiers, be careful with the victory symbol because the victory that's... symbol comes off as kind of like, you know, that's a cockney slur really? that is. You know, yeah. It's, that's I always F-U. do pee this way. This no, is if you put way. your if you Yeah, that's if you put it that that's, way like you're doing F-U. Don't do that. You're, that's yeah, no, terrible. I don't. Well, it also don't. means victory. That's Please. what I heard. Winston Churchill era. It was like, haha, we won. You know. Yeah, because we still have our bow fingers. I mean, it, even if it wasn't true originally, I'm sure that's what Winston Churchill believed about it. Okay, but they back in that day, didn't they often? do a documentary saying that they <laughs> used the other hand to shoot with on a bow because it was faster to reload? Yeah, there's, there's that's what I mean. There's probably no truth to the bow finger story. I, I think yeah, there's a wiki. Lose- Thing that says no they they used to that's the story though is cut off your your bow fingers Take however okay yeah who knows if it's true now, usually like it when you're stringing an arrow on a bow the arrow i think 
Well, whichever side it's normally on, there's a guy who's figured out, I guess he taught himself how to shoot a bow and arrow when he was a kid, and he put the arrow kind of on the quote-unquote wrong side, but now he has the world record, according to Guinness, for yeah. all these kind of stunts for shooting two arrows in really? the air with the doing most it wrong with can the bend right them around the corners, you can skip Hood. it off the ground and hit things. And... Yeah, so instead of the left side of the bow to where he would line up, he would throw it up on the right side because it was quicker to reload. It's and like Jimi Hendrix hold... on the guitar, you know? Yeah, he would hold four arrows in a single hand and just fire them off. That's some Robin Hood type of shit there. Man, I knew a guy named Robin Hood, actually. Is that, I mean, is that related to the, the legend of Robin Hood? Because didn't he shoot a bunch of arrows? Well, this guy was just recent. Like, it was like within the last 10 years that really? like he became prominent on YouTube, was showing all of his videos. He was on he was Jimmy Kimmel, maybe. Shots. It could have yeah. been 20 years. Maybe I'm old. What do you think, though, about... So we were talking earlier about the electrostatic tether and this idea that we could get free energy just by harnessing it, but that it's so much energy that it's, like, too much energy. I mean, the ramifications of that much energy that's not supposed to go into a specific singular location, what kind of... Maybe that changes the weather patterns. Maybe that is the kind of thing that causes um, drift of the magnetic current or moves you know flips the poles slowly or well quickly. if you look at the pyramids and you look at what they were aligned with it was limestone and the limestone is conductive through electricity and also it had a gold capstone on top and it had gold running down all the sides of it so this is the reason i believe that pyramids were the perfect conductor of electricity to pull it from the ionosphere and it was running down and you look at every section that's inside the pyramid, it has different resonant frequencies. So I believe that the Egyptians knew what electricity was and they could categorize it between A, B, C, and D, just like oak trees. They have, you know, we have water oak, maple, or not maple, tree, whatever. There's different sectors of the same oak trees. And if you, this is the, um, the, energy grid the ley lines up on the earth right where all the pyramids are created so i believe that all the pyramids created the ley lines and it wasn't something that was already created to me it makes more sense that there was a giant flock of dinosaurs that were flying around the earth and put the pyramid there as their nest site and because it's geometric we think we did it and maybe again we might have put layers on top of it my understanding also is that the layers of the pyramid, when you measure the vertical height of the block courses, there's a progressive sequence that has to either do with prime numbers or with the Fibonacci sequence that is in tune with static electricity discharge. So if the idea that cats were worship, worshipped in ancient Egypt as well, um, bugs, right, are trust, bugs are attracted you, to light in flashing things. And so they would have been trust already, these things yeah. that naturally make it work. They're doing it so you can do it if they can do it. Yeah, so all of these nests and everything, they have the Fibonacci sequence built into it. And, but if you look back, and I keep on bringing this up about the APEC and the guy, David, that works for the DOD, he was talking about creating an anti-gravity device that he didn't call anti-gravity, but someone else did. And this is why I went to work with Jeremion, uh, or Jeremiah on, because it bounced off all corners and it would shoot straight up. So, Andreas, I think you were telling me about this the guy who had so much money that he created uh, Giza in his backyard or something that drew water out of the ground. And this is the it's same like Kid energy. Rock. He built he his own up. version of the Capitol. Yep. Yeah. That, it it flooded like the basement or something. Yeah. It wasn't yeah, Kid the Rock. Building, but... the, locations, the locations that they choose, though, I think it is interesting that there are locations that animals frequent naturally show up at. We're just another animal. We show up at, another, at the same watering hole as everybody else and then eventually decide to build our house there. You know, but you're ta Is he's talking else? the technology oh, that you that you showed that they used to build the pyramids that could have been done through water and routing. Is that what you're talking about? Because I know I thought way differently. And then you had done a video on um, floating the bricks or the bricks, like whatever the, the idea is that they created an enclosed block. tunnel. And then with the water pressure, you could float blocks up the side. It's because people can't get through their head that balloons and blimps existed back then. And yes, they, that was with, if you could wheel in your sails and get the jib tuned in, the, or what, you know, I'm not even using the right sailing terminology, but you could use that same set of block and tackle 
to moderate the for the vertical uplift forces from the blimps right. so that you could fine tune yeah. them and use them like a crane. And even so as simple as just you've got like rocks. So the thing is, you've got a path from the Nile and the Nile. This is also it's interesting, I think, for the dramatic timing, like someone should definitely make a movie with Brad Pitt kind of a thing about it. But <laughs> you take the water, the Taman resets um, dammed up so that the water can't flow and the water were coming down from Ethiopia. So also you got to see um, Egypt, Ethiopia. The, we have three seasons in Ethiopia. In, in we have four seasons in Ethiopia, three seasons in Egypt. So when the fourth season of of freezing ends in the North Mountains of Ethiopia and the water starts to flood out, then you have the third season that continues twice as long in Egypt, which is the flooding season. And so there's the a big water dam in Ethiopia that just got built and was a huge controversy because everyone downwind or downed water of where that dam is is going uh crops or right know? right and that's exactly what happened in the bible right because in the in this in the bible the story goes that uh joseph uh t comes the technical dream coat he ends up as a slave he ends up in egypt he ends up working for the pharaoh the pharaoh's the house it's like the mafia it's one of the rich families and he puts them in the most power that they've ever been in egypt because they damn the entrance to the Nile so that they can start building their new city supposedly. And in the process, they have seven years of plenty and then they have seven years of famine for everybody else. That's a downwind of them. And those people, then they have to buy crops uh, from the Pharaoh in exchange for their animals, their livestock and their land. And then they end up just using that livestock on that land that now is owned by the Pharaoh. And so they is, become. Is Andreas's mic clipping only in my ears, or is that everyone else's too? Just oh, I'm mind. sorry. It might be my fault for the mic being way far over oh, there. Oh, oh no, now we're good. We're good. That's way better. Is that my mic all the there. way off screen, but we can still hear you. I don't know. It's terrible. I got excited, but you get my point. That there's a there's a flood season, then there's a drought, uh, seven years of drought, and from that they end up taking over all of the land of Egypt and turning everyone into serfs. And so this is happening again. But in the process of doing that, they were able to divert the water for building the pyramids, probably. Because you take the water, you flow it around this area, and then all of a sudden, you are able to take the rocks, attach them to bamboo, and then from the bamboo, let me go back a page to show you that picture, um, you can have floats, right? These can be stomach linings of gut that are actually leather sacks that can hold balloons. And they're just holding it up a bit with buoyancy so they can push it around. Where did all the megafauna go? How many times to make, over? To make giant floaty water sacks, right? These are the guts of these uh, of these giant animals. Yeah. This that's reminds not, I mean, that's, me that's, of... that's a more plausible theory than migration or breeding issues or hunting. Well, it was a form of hunting, but purpose-driven. What's the and name the of same that? balloons. The way you see whales floating in the sky in some of these ancient – or in, even like a kind of steampunk era type stuff – it's that is actually what you would use for a giant balloon in the old days would be a giant uh yeah you'd use skin of a whale stomach what do you call that like an ancient the ancient water flask that's made out of a gut you know i'm talking about these things it's called, right? it's called a witch's bottle and it has crystals in it when you shake it that illuminate have you heard of that before i think that's different but still sounds good <laughs> it, it's because we can't accept that they had light bulbs back then either and that we found them and that they weren't built out of glass they were built out of skin that had been shellacked to create a closed system um but hmm. separate issue just on the pyramids quickly too I, this is, might have been an anecdote i don't remember where i heard it but a guy gets to the top of the great pyramid and he has a wine bottle that's empty and maybe tinfoil that he sticks in the neck of it and holds it up over his head and sparks shoot out of it. Yeah, because so that's the, whatever the electric GPM system is it's still there. Sorry, go ahead. No, that's the energy being created that I was talking about. Like, because it does bounce off the inside and limestone is conductive. And that's what they used to have on the outside of the pyramid. So it would travel up just like a transformer does on a higher gauge wire than lower gauge wire is going to create more current, but it's going to create more energy going upward. So it's I've going seen to it also happen. People on a hike, if they're on a ridge or a cliff, and when they hold their hands up, even without any wine bottle or tinfoil, they get electricity shooting out of their fingers just because of their, the grounding force or the something in the area. 
Yeah, that would probably be because of uh, positively charged ions, and then they're just going up to a higher altitude, and they're grounding everything out. And they are, so, you know, uh, it's organic it's like a material. power plant. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, I also it, think the pyramids are just a tailings pile, and usually the tailings pile is either going to flood your neighbor with sand or so. so instead of building a giant pile of sand that would keep washing back into whatever tunnels they were digging, they found a way to make like a sandstone concrete out of it. And that was just the most efficient way to stack it. And again, it doesn't have to be a human intelligence that did it. Or even, well, a, a, even a primate. You know. The pyramids are really weird to me because like they would bury the pharaoh at the very bottom, but they would always have like a what one inch by one inch square hole, like a one inch square that was shooting straight to the North Star. I think that's like a an, an analog to how Jewish couples used to get together, where they would sew them both in their sleeping bags, kind of, and just cut a small hole for. Sorry. Oh, maybe there's some truth Ms. to Noma. what we they talked about yesterday with the um, the seer or the remote viewer that was able to ascend with someone that had died and was headed towards the moon. What was that? Was that on your show, Burn? That you're talking about that. I'm to not sure. It was remote. It was remote viewing, and somebody died. Edward uh, uh, Casey. Oh, and they said yeah. uh, they, there was a bunch of them remote viewing the same person, and they all had to stop because he started to go towards the moon. So yeah, maybe so that was some trap. Why there was something like North Star or where the soul ascended to. I, I remember. Here. And that's what it was with the pharaohs because they would release his soul and he would go up to the, you know, to the stars. And that's the reason they drilled a hole all the way up directly to it. Not drilled a hole, but they constructed the pyramids with that in it. I think they were saying that's what keeps you reincarnating, like when your soul goes to the moon. Mm. Well, they like physically saw this. I, I don't think Julia was even, were you there when they were talking about that? Probably not. No. Everyone knows the word yeet, right? Y-E-E-T kind of means to get flung. Off. So I saw something where it's a form of quantum locking where they took a bunch of small neodymium magnets and kind of had them hovering. And each time you added one, it would kind of snap into a different geometric configuration. And then if you added one too many, something about it, one of the other magnets, as soon as you put that one other, other one into this floating array, the other one would just launch and just disappear off the frame of whatever. So oh, whenever they drop them? Um, well, this is on a small scale, and so the implications is if you had five blimps hovering on some electrostatic charge and someone else came up to join the fray, who knows what forces are at work and it could just boot someone out of whatever balanced array that they're in. Or I don't know if that made sense. <laughs> yes. By what are you changing in the atmosphere to do that, though? You're saying there's a... They're altering like the harp sort of stuff in the yeah. well, on a hole in the ionosphere. Well, again, I'm not sure how it would work on a macro scale. I'm just I, what I saw was a tabletop experiment, and the implications of it are rather frightening, perhaps. It implies yeah. that there are yeah, forces at work and things that may be unanticipated. A certain amount of hertz. I mean, the, the bottom line is, I don't look forward to the great reset for a couple reasons, but. Right between the the goal of releasing a bunch of these extinct megafauna, which are going to be pretty dang tall. I mean, that's like that's a six foot bird, basically. So, right? Am I wrong? No, that's just that's a three foot bird. Sorry, not two meters, but still. I mean, there's a bunch of other birds that are that tall. Herbivores, aren't they? They're not. Oh, no, dude, birds are psychopaths. Yeah. They like to eat. They like to eat people. Here's what's coming, is all I'm trying loon, to say. The loon bird can eat two pounds. Coming think, back. Five pounds the loon bird? Or you mean like the, the loon? Like my Minnesota State bird? The loony and... Now, uh, now everyone's yeah. microphone is clipping. I wonder if it is just me. All sorts the of loon, loon is up. terrifying, man. No, they disappear. Loons are peaceful. They, they make a weird noise, though. They can eat like three times their own body weight in oh, meat every there time. There we go. Day. He's finally here. We got The, the loon himself. He's shifter. Good day. Welcome. Did oh, you get hey, Jeremiah. Files, good, sir. Oh, Jeremiah's here? Yay, Jeremiah. Life machine. How are your plants look? Audio I want to see how your plants are Audio working. test is working. Okay, good. I just will notify you that because of where I am, compared to my signal quality, 
if um, if I'm talking, you guys will be able to hear me. But if anybody else is talking at the same time, StreamYard will auto prioritize me as last, and it'll cut out anything. Just so you know, this is the whole stream is trash in my end. Bad. Right now. Is that I can't have like or? a uh, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, I can hear what you're saying, but every, everyone's clipping in and out. Uh, right. Well, the, the broadcast, as far as when it sounds good to me, it actually uh, shows uh, the audience something different and lets them hear something different oh. than what you hear live. So that's one of the things that I noticed about this program is like, I'll be, uh, I'll want to hear something that somebody was talking about and it sounded perfect while I'm in the actual stream, but then I go back to do the rewatch and they get completely cut off. So. Yeah, I'm uh, working on fixing that by both learning editing as well as now uh, doing recording, local recordings for everybody. The StreamYard's given this new option for uh, audio and video local recordings, and then it, uh, I get it afterwards. I don't know. It's a process. I've been trying it out. It seems to be working. And uh, hopefully... Okay, so uh, as per the usual, I've got... I've got things set up. Give me just one moment. Perfecto. Live demonstrations are always nice. I'll just go ahead and warn, pre-warn you guys. Jeremiah and I talked on the phone. And I was very disappointed in my own coils. Oh. Oh, who in the what now? Yeah. I, I mean, well, Jeremiah knows way more than I do about electrical engineering. This very smart and so anytime i hear something negative i'm disappointed in it but i'm very like i'm looking forward to what jeremiah can continue on with to improve upon it eager to learn right we're all here for learning that's what it's all about yeah and... i definitely will uh agree with that completely this is a whole learning experience. No, nobody has all the answers. We're figuring this thing out as we go. And quite frankly, I consider all the coil technology, it's a very modern iteration of a very ancient geometric technology. But by using electromagnetic fields and trying to produce some of the same results that were done by gaseous discharge, and then prior to that were actually done by large stone structures and various uh, crystal resonators. I mean, this is it's just the latest iteration in a long series of geometric studies that affect the human biological system. All right, so a um, little radiation roadshow. I just got these gifted to me uh, earlier today, and these are radiation. Uh, these are radium clock dials. And so um, it's too bright in the room to see them, and they don't glow as brightly as they used to. So I do have a little black light source, and you can, you know, you can see them glowing there underneath the uh, LED provided. UV and here I'll just reflect it off the pan so you can see that light right there. That's what it looks like. But yeah, um, some of these are very, very highly active. Like this one here is a uh, powder from a bunch of uh, clock hands that have just been kind of ground up, scraped off. What I was surprised by, and the reason why I needed radium is because I've been looking into radioactive batteries as uh, permanent or lifetime device power solutions. And right now, radioactive batteries generally use something like a tritium vial um, or, or some other um, gas that, or some other um, outgassing or radioactive decay isotope that produces photons as a natural result of its decay. Or perhaps they use like a scintillator crystal to produce photons. And they use little solar panels inside to pick up that tiny fraction of a percentage of the radiation output from these particles that are also pumping out alpha and beta uh, particles. So Alphas are just extremely, extremely fast electrons. They have a negative charge. The, tr the trouble is that they're going near relativistic speeds when they leave. So the fact that you have an electron flying damn near the speed of light coming out of these radioactive sources makes it very difficult to use. And so radioactive batteries of today don't use it. They just waste it. Um, instead, they try to produce photons with it. And then the other thing is beta particles. Beta particles are extremely fast uh, particles that can be they're protons, neutrons, and, and these things are also traveling in with such high velocity that you're going to need to slow them down, but they will have a positive charge. And so generally you're looking at a proton that either quickly decays in, into a neutron or uh, simply pops up out of existence and becomes energy and produces a, a huge burst of gammas as it does so. The point is that there are many different ways that a material can decay it can't, depending on what kind of stress it's under. But protons and neutrons, when taken and stripped out of the atom, are not very stable. And what the, mod what the uh, old way of doing it was, is to capture the alpha and betas, which are alpha is negative, beta is positive. You would use a 
parallel plate grid and you would impart an acceleration momentum to the two particles that so would fly past these two grid plates. And you'd, you'd have the positive plate um, on the top here. You'd have that on the um, alpha side. So it's going to repel the charged particle and you'd have the negative plate on the beta side. So what this is going to do is slow down the velocity of those two particles and also experience an electric field increase between these two plates. And then you have another set of plates down the line at the Fermi distance for where you want to collect these charged particles and, you, and they'll actually fly apart and hit the plates or they'll cross over and hit the plates and be absorbed. So in this way, we can actually use the real energy of a radioactive isotope, in this case, radium, is what I'm planning on doing and making sort of a, um, I guess you would consider it sort of like a, a clay or a, like a soft um, acetic gel that will allow me to bombard these with electromagnetic fields and try to increase the rate of decay cyclically in an LC oscillator so that as these physical charged particles are being collected and added to the power of the circuit, I can also simultaneously boost the radioactive output by, radi uh, by high frequency or uh, ultra high frequency bombardment. So just to kind of show you what these things are doing and, and by comparison, these are pieces of uranium ore, just raw uranium ore. Some of them are more colorful than others. You can see some like yellowish, greenish spots, kind of look like yellow cake. This one has a lot more of those spots on it. Never actually try to see if these glow. Yeah, I guess, yeah, they don't really glow. Not li nothing like the radium, unfortunately. But this is uh, ordinary uranium ore. And we can see on the meter here. It's It's fairly, you know, mild. I wouldn't consider this dangerous. Like I'm not worried about holding it because it's not incredibly powerful. We have a huge piece over here. And even if I stick the probe directly on that huge piece, we can watch that meter rise there. We're going to peak out at less than 0.3 or 3000. So by comparison, here are some thorium mantles. And the thorium is mostly an alpha emitter. It also emits a uh, decent number of betas. J Jeremiah, can I can I interrupt you right quick? I, yeah. I just want to check. I, I can always just try hopping in and off the stream. Is his is the sound clipping for everybody else, or is it really just on my end? Because I, I think just on your end, yeah, it sounds okay to me. Because it fit it fixed when you pulled the mic closer when when you did it. But hmm. this, this is the kind of thing that if I'm tuning in as a an audience member and the mic's clipping like this, I don't know, yeah, man, no, we can't hear it clipping at all. I think it's only on your end. Interesting. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, Jeremiah. It could be in your uh, headphones there. The yeah, connection. I'd rather have you interrupt an audio issue instead of letting it continue on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But you, what you were saying was interesting. Okay. <laughs> You're playing with yellow cake, for goodness sake. <laughs> Maybe that's what's doing it. Yeah. Well, it's not quite. It's not quite to that stage. Like I said, that that, that was natural uh, uranium ore. You can simply chip it off pieces of rock on sites that are totally available and legal to do so, and uh, they're not. They're not refined. They're not super strong. And I was showing them as a comparison. Um, now, this is some thorium. Man these are thorium mantles as they appear. These used to go in old Coleman lamps. And if you heat these up under a flame, they get crazy, crazy bright white. And so they will be a great um, converter of just any kind of thermal energy into a photon source. They will very easily give up electrons. But uh, this is basically those mantles that have been burned down under a high temperature flame. And this is a total of four of them in this little bag. And... Um, Oh man, is it hot. So if I just set that directly on there, you can see we're already coming up, climbing past 4,000 and above. So from about this distance, it's not all too wild. And this is where it gets interesting with radium because radium is so retardedly radioactive compared to uranium and thorium that even if I get it close like this, like I'm not even touching it, I'm, I'm damn near pegging my meter already. And all of these are basically like that. This one on the back, in the back here isn't quite as hot as the others. Now, these were clock handles, and they're, they're the most UV responsive. They're also the ones that still glow. If the uh, lights are off, they still have enough radiation to continuously produce uh, photons. So they are also crazy, crazy hot. You can just see the meter being pegged up there. <laughs> so 
that kind of gives you an idea. And here's the powder. Again, I'm still about uh, three inches away and it's, it's pretty hot as well. So this, the reason why I really needed radium is because this radioactive battery patent that I was, that I was uh, offered to me by Anthony Williams, great patent. And uh, I have about 25 other uh, nuclear battery patents. Well, that one specifically talks about a very simple mixture of uranium, thorium, and radium powders. Mixed together, basically pressed into a, a wafer, about five millimeters thick, which I don't think it needs to be that thick, honestly. And then there's a layer of zinc, and then there's a layer of uh, copper, and, and then it just kind of alternates between cake, uh, zinc, copper, cake, zinc, copper to form this entire uh, pile. And around the sides of that pile are a set of electromagnetic pulse coils to, to oscillate this thing using an LC oscillator. And according to the patents and the design, the stack of these materials allows the freed electrons and charged particles to have a polarization under the, elect under the magnetic field. And it stimulates emission of radiation, meaning that the decay rate actually goes up cyclically per peak of current going through the coil. And that, to me, that concept was just amazing because what that means is you have something larger than a AA battery, sure. You have something larger than a computer chip, you know, uh, radioactive cell. But what you end up with is a radioactive system that doesn't produce leak radiation because it's being captured completely inside the cell. And on top of that, you have something that can power, say, 10,000 watts instead of something that can only power a fraction of a fraction of a milliwatt. I mean, literally, radioactive batteries of today they can't keep an LED lit. They don't have enough power. But using this method, they could. So we're going to find out. I've got the ingredients. They now. just can't and do it, Captain. They don't have the power. Oh, there's no I, risk uh, of saying they're not going to, like, explode or melt down. Or... There's this, I want to really quickly show this footage just for a second. So this is some footage that Dolly Moore took of. It looks like the balloon coming down. She says... Um, okay, so here's what I just caught a few minutes ago out my window. I saw a jet go by so fast, and then the explosion in the sky. Holy Billings, Montana. Official communication Billings, Montana stated we've confirmed with Montana that there have been no explosions in or around Montana. But then there's this video which is like kind of looks like you know the Elon Musk rocket or something going down. Yeah, that looks more like a rocket trail than I guess that could be a very extended out. Hey, That's... Brittany, what was the name of the comet, that green meteor or that came in the other day? Do you remember? Those gases would have been just yeah, went green. right into our atmosphere and not left a trail like that. Yeah, that's ridiculous. If you were going to safeguard technology about going to space, one thing you might do is give all the information about how to get up there. And then this is people trying to get down. Oops. So that's yeah. supposed to be a balloon, hey? Yeah. No, that's that not looks like a rocket trail for. Yeah, I'll believe sure. it if it's on fire. I mean, if if the official story is the thing was you know shot down with some like a military laser and it was on fire as it was falling, then maybe that makes sense. But otherwise, like. I thought helium had. <laughs> so definitely not. Definitely not Joe Rogan. Just asking the question if if radio is radio. That much flammable material on board. It's a chem trail. Oh, Looking at it is a mirage, I guess. So what? Jeremiah, do you want do you want to comment on that? There, there was a question from the audience about um, isn't aren't radio waves uh, radioactive? And like even visible light as a form of radiation is radiation, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, visible light, the entirety of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, from the longest, longest wavelengths, naturally occurring uh, telaric uh, signals, all the way up to the extremely, extremely short gamma ray bursts and those above those frequencies are all part of the electromagnetic spectrum and they are all forms of radiation. The differentiating thing when something is radioactive versus when it's simply electromagnetic radiation is when the material on its own produces electromagnetic radiation simply as a result of its, its process of decay. That's what makes something radioactive. Like in, when infra you don't need to put oh, an hour infrared is radio. also. I mean, does it? Are we decaying if we're emitting Whoa. infrared light? I don't know. So is that only organic? Okay, time out now. This is linked to like organic chemistry as well, with decay. So there's certain things that don't have any type of radioactive decay. Uh, yeah. Like, I mean, everything. Everything has technically some radioactive decay. It's just that a lot of materials they're they're fairly stable. So. They have decay uh, half-lives that are like as long as the span of the known universe, so far as we can tell. And so technically, they are always at 
at risk of decaying and you might at any point just have a, a random mm -hmm. proton pop out and or a random neutron pop out and you could get an isotope or a decay product or a, ch a transportation of the element but the chances of it happening are so incredibly slim and the half-lives are so long because they are so stable that we don't consider them to be radioactive to say the least they're Jeremiah, beyond our methods uh jeremiah you actually have a full table of radioactive material i'm gonna send you a faraday apron a faraday apron i have a faraday yeah. apron that won't save you from gamma radiation not one bit in fact it won't save you from gamma beta or alpha <laughs> best i got best i got Oh yeah, no worries, man. I'm I'm building a bismuth case for this stuff. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe you should postpone until you have it. Just hurry up and have some kids, and then you can or, do it. Or have well. like gloves on, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> you know, people are, people are so afraid of radiation, and they don't need to be afraid of radiation. They just need okay. to understand what the dangers are. They think if you're irradiated that you somehow are now walking around radioactive. No, you've actually got to get that stuff into your bloodstream. You've got to get it into your skin. Uh, so you notice everything I have up there. You do not have to get that stuff in. Guys, do not get that stuff into your skin. No, no, you don't have to. Okay, no, that's that's it's not to you affect you. That. In order to be dosed with a lethal amount of radioactive material, it's got to be on or in your body is basically what I'm saying. And so you've noticed that everything I have bench it's either in a bag or in foil or in a container or something else that allows it to be handled so that the only thing coming off of it is the alpha beta and gamma radiation with absolutely none of the physical material possibly entering my skin so that means when i walk away from that table i'm not taking it with me having said it's that okay. don't anybody try this at home don't anybody are do all those so baggy bad. sealed those are getting into your lungs I yeah mean... they're actually vacuum sealed it's hard to okay. tell on yeah that, i've okay. sealed See, I'll, there is that. I'll actually be redoing that, that again because I want to standardize the size of the packets so that I can tell exactly how hot they are per uh, per square centimeter. And so I'll probably be resizing them into two by two uh, centimeter packages for a four square centimeter exposure area window. Wow. It just gives me some standardization so I can tell which which is what and exactly how much energy, radioactive energy is being emitted from it. And you're... So you're recreating these batteries. How long do you think they're going to last? Uh, my guess would be somewhere around 350 years. What? Can I buy one? Can I be? Can Can you put me on the list? I'm sure that I am not allowed to sell them. Okay, I'm just kidding. Let's uh, rescind that last comment. Um, but we can I would go like find some in nature and collect samples. I will find some in nature. Yes, and I, I, I can't uh, yeah. tell the batteries, but I will tell everybody exactly how they're being built. Because <laughs> all the materials oh on that bench are totally legal for me to own with absolutely no license and on, without regulation. So okay. long as I control them, do not uh, do not sell them, and do not uh, so, refine them. How could you sell them? Never, ever? You can't, like, uh, there's already patents for it? Or if you're changing no, no, it up I mean, a little bit, can't you make the Jeremiah battery? There are patents uh, for probably just about any uh, any variation of a radioactive battery, but the problem is that when you produce a radioactive battery, that automatically gets screened by the military industrial complex for its use in, in their applications. And the reason why we don't have high power national security radioactive batteries today in the civilian world, and why every time somebody like Elon Musk talks about the idea of a different type of direct conversion radioactive battery, it's huge news, even though. These things are in deployment, in satellites, in military vehicles, in critical systems, all over the military industrial world. Yeah. So is the second that I try to patent something like that, I automatically will get pulled into that analyzer. Oh, yeah. Told we're buying this. Here's the money. Shut the hell up. And if you don't, you'll end up in Guantanamo. So yeah. that's it. By give, by just simply telling people what I'm doing, which is entirely legal to do. If they do it themselves, then it's also legal for them. Just don't sell it. <laughs> don't try to patent it. And we do not recommend no. playing with uh, radioactive yeah. materials at home like, or pretty much ever. It's not the same control. as saying get your own chickens and uh, eat your own eggs. It's way different than that. Way. Well, I, I don't know about like how much bad information is out there regarding radio you know, the handling of radioactive materials and the safe usage and and demonstration but you have to keep in mind that professor that professors in 
universities across the world every year will handle these elements many, many, many times per year throughout the course of their lives and be just fine during the course of demonstration to their classes. And that's basically what I just did today is none of these things are so incredibly dangerous that I have to worry about it. It's not something that I'd want to put on a pendant. That'd be insane. It's not a piece that I'd want to sleep next to. But there's something that I can have completely across the room for me. And if I take my Geiger over here, it's got one of the most sensitive windows I can buy. I mean, it's it's ticking basically as much with the radiation it's receiving from that as it is from cosmic background and uh, gamma ray bursts and stuff. So, like, when you're 10 feet away from it, you really don't even have to worry about it existing. Um, Dude, what about the red mercury? Uh, Stefan, are you still here? And Jeremiah, what do you think about red mercury? And also Rife, anybody, anybody, red mercury? Well, the new the new red mercury, because, again, we, we can rehash the same old faux propaganda since 1970s and fill in the audience that probably has already watched every bad documentary about red mercury that's out there. Yeah, I don't know if it's true. But the new one is the Congo rocks. And I'd love, we, we can talk about red mercury too, but I'd love to get Jeremiah's input on what he thinks about. Um, yes. To speaking of getting things on your hand, these guys look like they've been drawing with graphite all day, so to speak, and their hands are metallic almost. And then they're holding what two rocks this? together that are just sparking. Jeremiah, um, have you seen this new uh, no, material I'm out of Africa? Or like, claims yeah. go back to sleep. They just uh, put like two wires up, lights up the LED like nothing. Supposedly, this electric material. You know that sounds an awful lot like um, Thomas Townsend Brown's gravitational isotopes, which are apparently also permanently charged electrical materials. Uh, he made a version of a brick that could, when it wasn't uh, being, when it was being shorted, it would produce its own heat. So in winter, you just short the bricks out. And when they weren't being shorted, they would produce enough power to run your stuff. And you'd best build your house with these things was his idea. And they use these materials called gravitational isotopes, which were just uh, either powder, powders of rocks or solid rocks that would just generate voltages. Hutchinson kind of came across this, too. This part of his original and early days of crystal power cells is he would just take one of these big rocks and jam electrodes against it like there we go that's um, what I think. Well, this might be a dumb question but yeah we'll have to bring this up ask. with uh john and nancy next weekend in our next third episode with them on the crystal batteries exactly this topic that we are discussing yeah, uh, samuel cohen said that red mercury is manufactured by mixing <clears throat> special nuclear materials in very small amounts into the ordinary compound and then inserting mixture into a nuclear reactor or bombarding it with a particle accelerator beam. Uh, that actually, like, theoretically, it sounds practical. Um, Jeremiah, you said you don't personally believe that that one compound of it is uh, accurate. It's like... Um, we've discussed it before. It's yeah, the, the mystical SB two o two o six or whatever formula. Yeah, um, I can. What I what I can tell you is I I don't know about whether or not that formulation is even capable of existing or could be chemically synthesized. But what I can tell you is that the videos of somebody showing a little vial of red mercury and then then you know you see their hand in what looks like a mirror. Uh, and it's it's not visible and you know there's two plates and they pour it on one of the plates and you can't see the reflection in what looks like a mirror anyways if you watch those videos really closely and you slice them up frame by frame it's Wait. actually not a mirror it's a uh it's a little wall cut out with a uh clear um see-through mm -hmm. just nothing in it no no glass or anything sometimes they'll put glass just to get the reflections but anyways he's got his hand on the right side and the left side so you can actually can you see explain the that again you're saying that he claimed that because he dipped his hand in mercury you could see through it like no this no, red mercury no, that uh bad. sorry and andreas can you scroll down just a little bit on this and vibrate? word i was gonna just show my brain my brain okay so i was just thinking about a couple things here so let's let's go back for a second first off black panther has this magical rock called vibranian or vibranian it's like vibration okay, rock, yeah it's it's magical it's rocks in Vi black Panther. that's so fictional that's, that's from well, the movie. I mean, it's in a comic yeah. book that doesn't necessarily mean it's fictional Based but on, uh it's smart vibranium, metal from an asteroid if you think about um what's it called uh tantalum tantalum is made of colton and colton is found in uh, the congo and so 80 percent of the world's colton is mined in the congo you have it in your laptop you have it in your cell phone it makes your technology you breathe one colton one kilo of colton is worth four hundred dollars the people mining them make less than ten dollars a week it's uh 
it, it's used to make tantalum a heat resistant powder that can hold high electric charge vital component in modern capacitors so this is, called, this is again this is called coltan is there anything to back that up like proof of... which part well you can look up coltan i mean you can see if you like want to see coltan mining I mean, i've definitely seen shows about people mining coltan and it's probably found in near and in volcanoes if it was used for power for sure okay that's really interesting first time i heard the name coltan yeah me too it's a, I've been Joe Rogan did just do an episode where he brought on someone who talked for two hours about this type of mining. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's copper mining, coltan mining, cobalt mining, all these different things that they're Definitely using. Definitely related um, to volcanism as well. If you look into coltan volcanoes and images, they're coming from all different types of volcanism too, it looks like. I don't know. Interesting. And probably from asteroids as there could have but, been launch technology as well using it. So there was the one video of this new rock that was dug up mm-hmm. in Africa, though, that like straight up they put two wires to it and it was like lighting up lights and stuff. Um, well, right. And so the, uh, associated, the Associated Press, what was it called? Um, what was it called? What was the Congo Stone called? Congo Rock? Um, the Associated Press. God, that bird freaks me out, right? The, the number three is the one that really I don't want to do. Oh, my with. God. Um, but they were saying it looked like it was probably pyrite or something. Um, but it I think pyrite ish. Well, that's what they're claiming is that it was fake and it was really just pyrite. But if it was actually something else, you know, Colton isn't too far off looking from that, right? So I wouldn't be surprised if it, it was something. But then they're saying you couldn't have electricity. Stored it in like it already. Growth. No, not that one. I'm sorry. Which one? This guy here? No, yeah, that one. Yeah, just without the colorization. Mm hmm. Well, so this is the alleged video of it. Yeah, easily could be faked, right? It could have a battery like in between the rock and thumb or another wire. Um, a little right? But it's like. Is this a legit discovery? Is this stuff real? Very, very fascinating. I mean, if you go back, I, it looks like he has another rock in his other hand. Right. So yeah, he like, he easily comment. could be a prank, but uh, um, would like to hear more about uh, this. If Can I ask Jeremiah too, and it might be related or totally non-related. But, yeah, um, so oh, like, was it uh, exposed as a fraud, like not legit or... Uh, yeah, he's holding something else. And... Um, if well, you're that's the thing. There, I want to ask yeah, you here, go ahead. about virgin magnets and how they impact the life, if they impact lifetime of battery or if they're involved and how that, if it's an untouched magnet versus can you recharge a magnet to its full capacity as a virgin magnet? I just kind of wanted you to explain. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about that. So sorry, a, vir- a virgin magnet just is going to refer to a magnet coming straight from the factory. And it, by the time it gets to you, it's already been touched. A, pro- probably you know 40 50 times after so it's no longer a virgin capacity. magnet well the, there are, there never has been such a thing as a virgin magnet because in order for yeah. one to, you would have to have an entirely machine automated process in which nobody ever <gasps> the material ever... there is the phrase n- the idea of never sullying natural a, uh... nuclear reactors are virgin magnets okay thank you jeremiah Okay, so there's, so there's no a different, hold on then, that means there's a different uh, definition of virgin magnet that I'm not familiar with, so I'm not actually answering your question with that. Well, no, if once it's touched by anything, um, a human, it's no longer a virgin magnet. It has to be literally found in its origin. Its but if you create state. it, wait, it, can't you create a new magnet by taking, yeah, isn't absolutely. it Thesius? Like, right. for example, I can take, uh, I can take a one inch by eighth inch thick neodymium disc magnet and i can repolarize that i can completely reverse the direction of the north and south pole on that if if i want to i can cancel out the poles and squeeze them to the center um i can make half of it uh you know i can make like a ring of north on the inside a ring of south on the outside and repolarize the uh the angle of axes though it doesn't work as well so yeah you can completely repolarize remagnetize unmagnetize and change the field position of of any kind of permanent magnet it's the easiest to do on neodyniums because they have a very low curie temperature. It's a lot more difficult to do on ceramic magnets because they are incredibly rigid and they don't like to repolarize. 
but it mm. is possible at a thousand degrees. It just, you've got to get the and, stuff. Um, is there a male, female end, and is it, does it impact one side more than the other when you're talking about a virgin, like magnet? Like, I don't know if that makes any sense. Um, you know, the Adelaide Scanlon breakdown, I've been just trying to understand what he's talking about, the essentialness of having a virgin magnet and a male. And um, once a f the female magnet is soiled, he keeps referring to, that cannot be brought back. And the closer they get together, the more chance they have of destroying each other, essentially. But it's the female that has to be pure, he keeps going to. So it's it's I an just... interesting way of looking at it. The way that I see magnets and um I can I can kind of describe this. If you just take a look at uh you say you take a disc and imagine just you draw an arrow all the way around, you know, the face of the disc that's moving, you know, that that points clockwise. So you're just using an arrow to say clockwise direction. If you were to, if that was a clear disc and you flipped it upside down and you were looking at it from the opposite side now the arrow will be pointing in the other direction. Now imagine that that arrow represents the inside of the magnet and it represents the trillions of little aligned electron valence spins that are giving it its magnetic field. All that arrow really means is that the direction of the electrons as they're orbiting around is in one, you know, is in clockwise from the face that you're looking at or counterclockwise from the opposite face. So if you're looking at the clockwise face, you're looking at the North Pole. If you're looking at the counterclockwise face, you're looking at the South Pole. But technically, there is no North and South um, inside the magnet. There is no actual separation between a North and South Pole. There's just one single spin direction that is shared by all of the electron valences. So it's just, I look at magnets more like a rotation and a spin direction instead of considering them to have a north and a south pole and that's it, it, as far as atomically and molecularly that's what's actually going on on the inside so it's just that we Very give hard. we give names to which direction we're looking at it from so it's all personal then it's, it's you know it's, yeah the preference of north and south is is really a, a preference of terminology because there is just there's just spin. And you can say, I'm looking at the clockwise side or the counterclockwise side, which is technically far more accurate. Hmm. Okay. It's a weird way to consider magnets, but when you understand how, how it is that they work and you can use that same knowledge to reprogram them and do just about anything that you want with them, then it becomes a very useful thing to uh, know. Have you read a good book for every home and decoded it then? You're the only I've person I've never actually heard of it. Oh my gosh, that's Ed Leeds Scanlon's coded book for how he made the Coral Castle. And you're probably the only person that could accurately decode it because it's it's written like it's about um, a, a girl and a boy, but it's really coded because it's about magnetism. And he's talking about the Sweet 16 and Virgin Magnets. And yeah, dude, that's interesting. Someone tried to decode it and I caught the video and realized it was about magnets and the electricity and how he had done the coral castle. Uh, I'm gonna you. Anyway, I'll send you a copy sometime and it's, it's a quick read or you can even uh, find the PDF, but you could break that down probably better than anybody. What was that sound? Was that just Jeremiah falling over from all the radioactive activity on the table? It could have been me or I heard. <laughs> okay. He's still there. Never mind. <laughs> Sorry, it could have been me. It could have been like my heart, like, like ah, what? Uh, sorry, I'm freaking out. Awesome. Um, I need a copy of that book as well. I've I, seen yeah. a couple people that have done a couple um, different portions of deciphering uh, Ed's mm -hmm. work, and um, it has He's... to do with the magnetic geometry of how the field um, and current of magnetic force moves interesting and uh i've seen some people add color into it into like a three-dimensional um system of it if you read and, it without uh, knowing it sounds very like perverted it's all about um yeah not having sex essentially sweet 16 and uh it's a birthday and she's got to be a virgin and it's all about it's about magnetism and exactly yeah and it'll it'll it's interesting it's mind uh mind boggling it, um it's very similar also to like walter russell's work and the um philosophical 
metaphysical side of their physics writing and understanding uh, with it too. Um, that it's like, yeah, Jeremiah explains stuff so um, just in ways that it makes sense. So I, I Britt, to, to, to tie into what you were saying, there's another kind of allegorical piece of history about virgins being sold and a virginal used to be like a piano or a keyboard that has never been used before. It's perfectly tuned from the manufacturer, that sort of thing. And so there was like, you know, advertising going out that they were selling virgins at the churches in New England. <laughs> and probably at different phases of time, that was true in various ways. Um, uh, yeah, I've not heard that before. With that, so you put out a call where it, Ford, it, like Ford, clear. said he'd, he'd pay five dollars a day for people who were strong and competent mechanically. And what it did, it meant that every family lost three of its most knowledgeable, strong, solid members because they all went to Detroit looking for this mythical job for five dollars a day. That may or may not have existed or even if it did it, was it worth the journey and what did they leave behind and what did what happened to the family as a result of just five dollars that was all it took was someone putting out an advertisement that hey we're hiring five bucks a day and like two-thirds of the country's family is like starved to death you know it's, oops and again i don't think it's on purpose we, we do things like this as a human species that um I, I'm, I'm always amazed that we're still here you know Sorry for the bleak sense of humor. Oh, no, no problem. Oh, I'm sorry. Kind of sorry. I'm sorry. Rush. Like during the gold rush, all these people came, you know, flying into just about any time that there was a, a large, you know, public made claim that, hey, there's gold here. And then it's going to be flooded with people that are trying to get their hands on that, too. So it's that virgin land. And at that point for the gold rush, it was this virgin land that everybody wanted to get their hands on because it hadn't been, you know, pillaged already of all of its elements. And where you find gold, you also find a lot of other useful things as well, unless you're doing it, you know, in the river and you're panning, um, where you find gold deposits, you all oftentimes find a variety of other precious metals. And so it's funny how this, how the stuff gets pumped up from the earth like that. And it kind of ends up flowing in veins because it's far more liquidous than the surrounding material. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's, uh, there's also an thing. implication that if you do find sand and you're panning in it and all you find is gold dust and you're not finding other heavy metals and stuff, perhaps it was put there. Well, I've I think never heard the implication is and oh, gold. Go ahead. Back now. The river will naturally wash out just about everything else except for the gold because it's so heavy it tends to stick around and uh, it gets clumped up with the black sand and everything else that's also super heavy that uh, tends not to be dragged away by the water. Uh, what are we looking at here? Uh, Vinny St. Vincent channel. So this is uh, good old Roy. And uh, some of his experiments with Ed, the Edley the Scallon flywheel yes. that he's rebuilt oh, and uh, oh, yeah. deciphered and been testing with. And then uh, he connects to all Everything. other sorts of experiments. Sorry, what was that, Jeremiah? Oh, I was in, I, I talked to him on the phone. It was a pretty good conversation. He's definitely an interesting character. Nice. I yeah. You, um, has he decoded the book? Because I, I think it's like written to Jeremiah to probably understand more than anybody. Um, very, I may disagree with right. you yeah. this idea of monopoles. And uh, he sort of has this idea of magnetic monopoles flowing in almost a similar way that we consider electrons flowing. And you know, he was he was obviously able to do something with his with his understanding. So if I can wrap my head around what it was that he was trying to say and, and kind of just forgive the idea of his use of monopoles then you know maybe i can get down to the bottom of what it was that he discovered if you're in the private chat i did link the book i think that's the full pdf in its origin and uh yeah i don't know if save it for later if you get it time it's a, it's a quick read probably for you and let us know next time you come back because yeah i can't open it now because uh oh, there you go. i'm just saying check it later or otherwise i'll have burn someone will send it to you I, that's awesome Yeah. Vinny's a cool guy. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I just can't help it, but dude, stay away from the radioactive material on your table until you get some kind of suit around you, please. We want more Jeremiah's in the world. Yes. This I'm telling is you guys, great worry too advice. Much. <laughs> Bye. 
So guys, I I think it's like botulism though, radiation and botulism. Like if you're in, uh, it, I think I'm unmuted. Yeah, yeah. If you if you find a bunker and there's a bunch of cans in it and you want to save it all for yourself, you just test one can and you bring out your quote unquote radiation detector and it goes beep 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 beep. Oh yeah, botulism. Sorry guys, no, you guys can't eat any of this. And yeah, <laughs> yeah I got to tell you, I can tell you this much. If you had a can that was radioactive, it would not have botulism. Uh, yeah, any if you've got that much radioactivity, you're not going to have bacteria breaking down the uh, materials in the can and polluting it, which is what botulism is. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and people will literally eat each other before they'll eat something. If a, sign, a guy with a lab white lab coat like you, Jeremiah, says, "Oh no, 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 no definitely not. No, you can't, you can't eat this." <laughs> you're probably right about that. It's kind of crazy. Until they start looking at you with. Uh, and licking their lips um, and they got their <laughs> knife out, and you, that's the point where you basically GTFO. Oh, Jeremiah, you're imagine a measure of a surgeon away, is how Jeremiah. quickly they could perform an amputation, and so if you can do that to yourself and like give the wolf pack your arm instead of your whole body, maybe they'll like let, let you go. But you got to be able to stop the bleeding. I'd rather give them the end. Yeah, mor the morbid. Them. Sorry to bring terrible <laughs> vibes to the convo. Oh no, you're. Dude. No, it is true though that that was the measure of a surgeon. The wolf pack helps. Was how quickly you can amputate because in wartime, you know, if someone's got a lead bullet and they're bleeding out, I don't know. Well, and so like Walter Russell and Ed Lead Scallon, um, they used uh, like the male or female uh, sex gender as the terminology for north or south or like um, opposite or attractive forces, a lot of um, symbology and like hidden meetings within their works and writings. Oh yeah, so it's not like perverted, but if you read it without knowing that, you'd be like, what, this is a scientist? This is, yeah. And then once you decode it, especially if you're like, I don't know, a technician of any sort, like Jeremiah, um, the technician, uh, yeah, you guys have it all probably figured out. There he is. Um, but Jeremiah is doing the quail experiments too, where he was taking, uh, he bought, I don't know, we didn't know what it was. It was like oregano or basil. Some basil. Element, ba basil, basil from like your co op or your Walmart, whatever. And he just had it on quails with water and he generated a root structure from this material. And I didn't know if you're still running those experiments. I want oh, to. Oh, well, actually, we planted them now. So they've, oh. they've been oh, can, and, can we uh, take a look? Do you still have them under the like, pyramids? Just put them in the ground. Yeah, it's said. not like we're really getting, you know, doing that much with them. But uh, yeah, sure, why not? It's pretty fascinating, Jeremiah. It's just an experiment in itself. So that was really awesome. Um, so just repropagating. These are I'm testing these compared to how they handled it without the pyramid and and seeing if there's a difference in the root thickness and whether or not the original roots will will have trouble or if they're going to actually pick up they're actually quite a bit healthier than the comparable sample uh Whoa. which is here this one was not grown underneath the pyramid this one was grown without it and uh it's just into the general zone and the very ends of the roots although it's very hard to see they're kind of clearish transparent they're not that healthy oh, so no. what's the um, other one maybe the crops they were growing crops in these pyramids too eh so there's the potted basil oh. that, that was nice that's up. looking and, good oh they're all taken very very nicely uh, some of the green onions being planted. These are just like little one inch uh, pieces of the end of a green onion. So we used the rest of it, used all the green part. And then you can you can see like right there where that white part is, that was all that was left of the green onion. And uh, so now they've got, they've got roots and now we're gonna just replant them and let them actually uh, grow and propagate and we can get probably multiple uses and cuts out of them. Well, now that you have a set of my coils, can you actually, uh take one set that's up underneath the pyramid and one set that's not build a and just take them into another room that has a Faraday cage between them and run them on 528 hertz and see which one grows better uh i guess i mean it depends on how long how long i run them for because it, you know if that's the if that's the kit that i'm going to be sending back out then three minutes today oh yeah i mean you can do whatever you want to with that kit the the royal is going to be there tomorrow oh okay tomorrow yeah that's that's pretty soon so yeah what I, what i'm interested to find out is you know 
the other one, I don't know if they're the exact same coils or if they're slightly different. Um, they're different. But if they are the same ones, which uh, I guess you could tell me, are they? Uh, it's going to be the same 1.21 uh, ratio on it. But... Right. I was well. What they would allow me to do is I can use I can just simply use um, you know uh, the two thin wire coils at once, and I can find out how the amp handles that by comparison, which will actually be a very good test. So that I, I'm thinking I'll start with that, or I'll just uh, replicate the geometry and wind it with another um, 22 gauge. So. Yeah, um, I'm just, I, what I really want to see is how it's how it's going to handle that and how I would that. I would just use the Royal and keep it at 25 percent where we have it marked because it runs really well. And just yeah. I just want to see like the energy consumption of the plants up underneath the pyramid versus not. Well, I can run it. I can I, I guess I'll say I'll run it for a day and see. If no, I would just do like three minutes a day. Oh, three minutes a day. OK, I yeah. see what you I thought you yeah, would take it there continuously like the other one that I have there. I don't take it to the... like a Faraday situation to where it's not affecting the plants in that room and then just run it like three minutes a day and do like in the other room do a pyramid, no pyramid, because I want to see which one grows better at that point. Yeah, actually, I can I can certainly expose it for a few minutes a day. I think I need a slightly larger pyramid as well. Uh, one that can actually hold those coils because right now this pyramid is just a little too small and I can't use the pre uh, the pre cut 10 inch by uh, 9 inch panels that I'm currently cutting the uh, pyramid shapes out of they're just a little too small so I'll, I'll probably just get some much larger sheet and I still need to metalize the corners I still do want to chop off the top and put an appropriately sized capstone because I do believe that'll make a tremendous difference if it's already going to naturally charge up that capstone we know that plants grow towards electric charge. Fantastic set of experiments have been done, and we haven't really talked much about this on this show, but there's been a fantastic and extensive set of experiments done to use charge and nothing else to control the growth direction of plants. And uh, my yeah, favorite this example... Is, uh, this is something that I was that I think that Bernie and I were talking about with Brittany and moving into in the future with, like, soils and plants and agriculture. Mm. Yeah, a hundred percent. I'm gonna be setting it up um, within uh, the next two to three weeks. Here, a whole series of different uh, seed tests of like lettuce, uh, spinach, and uh, kale. I kind of wonder if I can do a live stream and set it up here in the office with oh. no volume need, because I have workers that come in and just grow a plant and just watch it live stream. Yeah, that'd be mm. watching that grow. Yeah. But at turbo turbo speed, that you know the tan. Um, I was trying to say Giant is the soil expert, so Andreas, you should really get Giant in here to talk to these guys if you can, because he well, is like um, he's really well versed in that stuff yeah There's we're gonna a, put together like at least a monthly if not eventually weekly agriculture show just for doing all the different tests with agriculture and focused on uh, horticulture and growing cool. stuff and experimenting with and it we can get lights people that are using um different types of lighting coiling water well there's a japanese guy who's using a shield and he's blocking out certain light frequencies and he's only letting certain frequencies in. he's having amazing results that's it, cool. it's kind of like a uv shade but he's uh, i forget the material he's using but i could probably hmm. replicate it yeah interesting and absolutely david will I'll have find my back. lrh to the phone yeah, Brittany, I want to do a show on ancient David, soil samples. David who? David's here? Did you say? David Sorry. M. In the Is chat. David Schwimmer? David Sh Schwiggard? Sorry. Plasma <laughs> bubble guy. I'm just, I'll stop. Oh, no, no. This Schweiermeyer? <laughs> this is David M. Great Schwimmer. guy. David M., you're great, too. I'm sorry. I'm muted. I believe also in California, L.A., if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Wait, so do you mind if I ask really quick, guys, Jeremiah, what's your impression of the coils? Like, totally harsh criticism. Well, as we talked about, the copper mass for each is not is not balanced, and um, the idea of the half-turn ratio 
is I'm not necessarily against it, but when you're talking scalar resonance and as we talked about, it's just one wire gauge change. You're just going to make actually the thicker coil one wire gauge thinner, and basically then you're you're there. You're you're a difference of 0.02 percent at that point if the uh, if the insulation the enamel thickness is consistent between the two different gauges. So you obviously don't want to mix. You know, like well, I guess it was. It's not really going to matter what your build is, but yeah, just looking at the charts. You're you're then going to be point two, you know, uh, zero point zero two percent instead of the uh, like the one point uh, two six that it's at right now, and that I think it's going to help it a lot. But the other thing is, I I would just quite frankly and flat out recommend way more turns on the uh, thicker wire coil, and I would even recommend you know going up to like a three quarter fact or either either that or adding more turns to the other one, and the reason for that is low frequencies. Low frequencies are where the amp is really going to have the hardest time. And it's because the, the inductance of those coils is so incredibly low. There's just not that many turns. And uh, the, the amp is going to have the hardest time at lower frequencies where that tiny little bit of inductance is basically acting like a dead short. Yeah, so we were talking about earlier, for people that don't know, uh, Jeremiah and I were on the phone and we was uh, discussing like using a larger capacitor to where it doesn't overload um, the returning electricity coming through on the terminating impedance. Right. And the basic premise was this. You've got an inductance that is extremely low, but still present. Any inductance can be balanced out with a certain value capacitance to set a frequency. And so assuming a basic capacitance decade box, which is just a short aim of, of a box with a few different values of capacitors that when added together you can basically choose any any uh, digit from one to ten in terms of your microfarads nanofarads whatever value you happen to need in your case it's going to be microfarads yeah. so you just have a simple box that you can you can mix it and you're going to put the a right amount of capacitance across the coil for uh whatever frequency this could theoretically be done with a six pole or a, a six stack rotary switch which is just a component that you can simply buy and use that to switch the coil. Bernie, right. Bernie, you're muted. I don't know if you're trying to talk. No, no, I, I know I'm muted at the moment. Thanks. But uh, yeah, it could be it could be done fairly simply with a with a rotary switch, and you would just select, you know, one through ten basically as the multiplier of whatever frequency you're going to be pumping in. So if it's, you know, five two eight that you're going to put into it, you'd basically just you'd want something like a five point two. So your first knob you go to a five, and then the second knob you'd go to a a uh, point two, and then that it would be very easy to set. And then if you wanted to change your frequency, you just change those two dials, and then you'd have a capacitor arrangement where yeah, you're going to be a quarter wave shifted, but at the same time, your amplifier is not having to source all that extra current through a dead shorted coil. You're going to instead be able to ramp the full amount of current in the sinusoidal waveform, and you'll cycle the power because you're actually pumping it back into a capacitor where it's resonating instead. Of you know, acting, treating the coil as resistor. And what that'll do is it'll multiply the output of the magnetic flux significantly. So for anybody that didn't understand exactly what that was, we're running energy back through it. We're creating energy out of energy or we're recycling energy. And this is future of Rife because Jeremiah is such a freaking genius up on everything, uh, dealing with electricity that we're gonna make it more efficient. We're gonna make it better, and we're gonna make it work even even more so, uh, because we, we was discussing like the Fibonacci sequence and how it works within nature and the human body as well, and even within the ether. Yeah, and then there's of course there's there's also the multitude of different geometry that will all perform different functions, and that's where it gets really interesting. Now I'm not the expert on that, but you know. We'll we'll have to see if we can set something up on a private call between between the three of us, and like if anybody if anybody in the world knows about coils, he does. So, yeah. but ultimately, I can I can see what what are obviously electrical engineering issues that even without studying the coil geometry in great depth, I can simply tell you from the electrical point of view uh, what's going to happen as as far as the systems go and how to hopefully how to fix it. We're going to see if the amp likes it, if the amp uh, going to play nice. Or if it's going to try to phase lock with it, but I'm thinking all you know, all in all, even if I have to put a you know series coupled capacitor, which is a totally viable option, then I'll find out what that amp 
likes because I'm not sure what his configuration is yet. I, I assume it was a class A amplifier, but that's a, that's a class D. It's a class D. So yep. I, I do want to make sure that the modulation frequency then is not coming through and uh, we're not seeing that. And I'm surprised that it's actually generating that much heat. I wonder if no, that... it's it's not generating heat. It's uh, the terminating impedance that's shutting it down. Way to go, Baron. Yeah, awesome. No, as far as experiments, uh, that that was all I had the chance to set up tonight just, just before the stream. And um, I just put that shelf in. That entire shelving unit is basically filled with uh, custom-sized boxes that have absolutely nothing in them yet. And so I'm going to be organizing the lab and really just streamlining the workflow process here because it's Check kind of too. I don't know. forward quickly. Oh, I, uh, I'm not using a headphones this time. Take a crazy yeah. bath. Like, rinse your radiation off. Oh. <laughs> Oops, sorry about that. I guess I was muted. As I was saying, it was gone. Uh, 